We went to Guatemala with a, uh, uh, almost two million on the boat. We took about four hundred thousand cash off the boat and brought it back. I'm looking at it; it's got to be a, a typo, twenty-two thousand kilos. So I'm reading it. I'm reading the indictment. So it was forty-five point five million dollars. And I remember when I heard the story. Not that this is the most ridiculous story. And I thought. And that's, that's, you know, this is, it's, come on, stop it, bro. And there's the report on the three guys <coughs> that approach him that he gets into a fight with. And there's a, attached to it is a transcript. And so they pull the pilot and the co-pilot out, you know, the plane, they're standing there. They're like, okay, you, you guys didn't pay. And they execute him. Well, Doug just happened to be taking a piss in the jungle. So he then takes, so he takes off. He flies in there on his Private plane gets ca- convinces Castro to let these guys go. They load them all up. This guy's about six foot freaking eleven. He carries a forty four Magnum. And you know, you walk by there about three in the morning when and when they're in their REM sleep. Hold your uh, your nuts and you walk up in there and you try to get the motorcycle. Bangs on the door, butt naked, and I rip by about seventy miles an hour and Pat's jaw is you know he's like. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I'm here with Michael Hudson. Michael Martini Hudson, actually. No, don't say Michael Martini. <laughs> Mar- I'll start over. Mar- Mar- Martin. Mar- Mar- Martin. Martin? Can- yeah, the, on the driver's license, it says Martin because they made a mistake, but it's M-A-R-T-E-I-N-E. That's actual. So just say Michael Martin just- Hudson. Okay. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I'm here with Michael Martin Hudson. And uh, I wrote a story about Mike called um, Devils of Contraband, and which he never really liked the title of. But it's about basically he's essentially a part of the genre that is what's known as uh, cocaine cowboys. Uh, he was active in, well, he was, he was a part of the uh, Dirty Dozen, and then it, he ends up moving into the... Um, Uh, into smuggling operations in uh, Miami back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. And we'll get into that. And so it's going to be a really interesting story. So check it out. You know, I I, want to like I I typically start most stories. I obviously start, you know, with something interesting. And then I jump back to the origins of like where the person was raised, that sort of thing. So and and you were raised in, in, in Arizona, but your mom. But the way it happened was your mom was basically um just a, a maniac um, a teenager, right? She got married young, had two boys, you and your brother, and it, she ended up getting caught smuggling marijuana from Mexico into the United States. Correct. Right? And that's kind of like, the, to me, that's where the story kind of begins because it, it immediately start, it starts off with smuggling. It ends with smuggling. It starts with your mom. It ends with your mom. Um, because, you know, out of all the cocaine cowboy stories that are out there, There's just not many, there's almost no stories where there's basically a woman is running the entire operation and that's your mom. But so can we, can we start with, you know, like you and your brother were born in Arizona and that's the question. Prescott, Arizona. Right. Uh, 1954. Uh, I was born in 54. My kid brother, uh, um, 57 and we're about 18 months apart. Right. And um, what happened with uh, your dad? Was he around? Or uh, mother, uh, my mother left him right. and um, took me and my kid brother. And essentially, uh, my grandmother was very wealthy. She married a wealthy miner. She left my real grandfather and married a wealthy miner in uh, Arizona. He died, and and grandma got to mine. So mom, uh, pretty much, um, she wasn't so much of a maniac. It was just the uh, the, the uh, a product of you know, of uh, 60s, 70s, uh, the 50s, because they, you know, they weren't hippies then. It was, it was uh, essentially beatniks. Uh, that was that that era started, and she took me and my kid brother with her girlfriend Terry and her Corvette, and drove to Big Sur. And we lived there for a while. I have memories of that when I was really young, and uh, I mean, really young, like three, four. And then uh, she came back to Arizona, and we ended up getting. Uh, Taken care of by my aunt Carol Jean, Grandma Dickey. We called her Grandma Dickey because Ernie Dickey, Ernie Ernest I Dickey, was the CEO of the 
Cypress Bruce Copper Mine. Grandma married him, left my real grandfather, as I previously said. And, uh, you know, she left grandpa, took my, my mom and my Aunt Carol Jean with her. And, you know. Well, your um, mom started smuggling like. It was years later. Right, but the first she tried to run a couple of keys across the border in in Nogales. That was a that was a a, a few years later, but she, uh, you know, uh, you know, the pills, whatever, you know, and 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 the marijuana back then in the fifties and, and and the sixties. So probably the late early sixties, and then she got busted coming through Nogales, and my grandma had to go down there and. With Barry Goldwater, he had some connections, and he, Barry Goldwater was a very close friend of Ernie's. Right. Uh, he built the house, uh, and Del Webb. Del Webb built the Flamingo for Bugsy Siegel. He was the contractor to build Sun City in Phoenix. He built the house in Baghdad, uh, up there in the northwestern Arizona, where Grandma Dickey um, lived with my mom and my Aunt Carol Jean. Right. After Ernie died, so... You know, she so, was, uh, she was, uh, my mother was, they were pretty, uh, uh, more, more so my mom was, was pretty rebellious, you know, and, uh, just so she we, got, a, but she got arrested. She got arrested. They got her back in the United States. And, uh, uh, my grandmother said, I'm taking Mike and Doug away from you. And, uh, here's the rest of your inheritance and go where you're going to go. When you get there, give me a call. Right. And that was it. Mom went to Miami. Right. And, so, what, and what'd she do in Miami? I mean, she just she moved. Miami was really the was really the 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 uh, the mecca, you know, as compared to Big Sur and that those places in California. She came to Miami. It was you know it was uh, popular, and there's a lot going on down there then. And uh, mom moved down there, and with her her and her girlfriend Terry came down there, and she lived there. For, and that this is by this time it's what the 60s yeah and uh you know mid 60s late 60s and um uh my grandmother uh put us in military school in the early 60s and uh and then um we did a year in san diego at the southern california military academy and my kid brother then we came back to phoenix and she farmed she i was in a wreck with her when i was three years old and she was your crippled. grandmother my grandmother, she was crippled for life. She owned most of the town of Baghdad and, and a portion of, uh, uh, she had a farmer's market, you know, more or less in, in Prescott. And on the way there that evening, she had a load of strawberries and she hit a cow at 120 miles an hour. And it crippled her for life and it threw me through the windshield. So she, uh, after that, after she recovered, she didn't, they didn't expect her to live. After she recovered, she, uh, um, essentially sold off most of her interest in the mine and moved down to Phoenix and bought a palatial home down there and, and a large piece of property. And we went to military school from there. My mom was leaving us all over the United States with different friends. And then we wound up uh, um, being farmed out to the Mormon church. The bishop of the Mormon church lived next door. They got close to grandma, got her to build a wing on their 16th ward in North Phoenix. Um, at the uh, the uh, Church of the Latter Day Saints, and uh, the bishop um, coerced my grandmother into having us adopted through the Mormon Church to a to a family there, and we lived with them for nine years until Mom. By this time, Mom um, had lived in Miami all this time, and she decided to come back. She was a little more fluent. Uh, by this time, and she decided to come back and look for her sons. Well, I, I mean, at this point, your mom went, <clears throat> she went to Miami, but like that's where all the drugs were coming in at this point. Like, there's no DEA. At that point, there was no DEA. There was, uh, Miami wasn't really prevalent for the drugs then. The drugs were coming out of, uh, the marijuana was coming out of Mexico. The drugs were, weren't coming out of Colombia until the early, early, middle, late 70s. The uh, Carrillo, I believe, the Lord of the Skies. They were running the marijuana out of uh, Mexico and flying it in. Okay. See, and it was all different then than the, than than uh, than the uh, Neanderthal um, uh, format that the Mexicans use use now uh, with the with, with the tunnels, digging the tunnels, right. seeing all that jazz. They were actually flying it in. So the marijuana didn't. Uh, the Colombian marijuana was a much higher grade. 
than the Mexican marijuana. Most of them, they had, you had good Mexican pot, but um, uh, mom didn't get into that until the mid 70s. She flew us back to, to Miami. She had a uh, a sugar daddy, there, if you want to call it, you know, essentially uh, right. a, a, a guy that took care of her who was vice president of Lomboy Lawnmower Corporation. So she, by this time, she's pretty affluent. And she came back in 73 and got me and Doug and flew us into Miami because she came back, went to the step parents' house and says, I'm looking for my sons. And the stepmother goes, Oh, well, they're living down there by their, by their old high school. They've got a, and they're, they're, uh, they're, they're running amok. Well, we were doing burglaries and trading everything for the burglaries uh, for heroin, and then you know, and then uh, slinging the heroin on the street. Just same, just like how you grew up, right? <laughs> um, yeah, um, the detectives were looking for us hard. They, in fact, the night that Mom and Aunt Carol Jean came and and found us, well, actually, it was my uncle Jimmy. He came and found us and uh, said, "Your mom's out here from Miami. She's staying out at our ranch." My aunt Carol Jean took her part of the inheritance and built a, a 30 acre ranch way out in the middle of nowhere off of Beardsley Avenue in in a uh, way uh, it's all developed now those areas were essentially pristine when we grew up in to grow up in Arizona in the 50s and 60s was idyllic right so the step parents and we had four uncles we I essentially hunted and fished every square inch of Arizona uh, uh, hundreds of times growing up with them Le- learned the, the, the use of weapons was a Boy Scout and had a, that was a marksman with the Boy Scout with all the medals, you know, for the, the sharpshooting and all that jazz. And we hunted uh, winter and summer and fished winter and summer. So all that, that, that kind of a lifestyle was a Boy Scout. Like I said, my, my stepdad was, was the, uh, um, he was the scout master. So that's how we learned, uh, you know, weapons. Basically you, you grow up with that and you became, you became really adept with, with uh, firearms. So, all right, so your mom shows up, she takes you back to Miami, right? And you go back to Miami and I mean, what 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 happened? She put you back in high school. She no, said you we, guys are going to be accountants and lawyers. Was, no, school was out That's of the done. picture. We were already I was already a dropout. Right. Long hair. My kid brother long hair and we are already into drugs pretty much and mom introduced us to a an underworld that we had never it could have possibly envisioned. These were uh mom knew some of the most famous uh, you know like the Dixie Mafia, right? Like the Rick Cabrero and, and his crew. And these and are the guys. Ricky are- and uh and all friends of close friends of hers. We had next door neighbors that were that are very dear to me. They're, and there, I'm not going to mention any names, but they were, a lot of us fell into the, uh, the, the marijuana smuggling, flying it in from Columbia. But mom didn't get into that till me and Doug kind of, I was more or less turned off by Miami because I really wanted to ride a Harley. I was still young. I was 17 years old. So I went back to Phoenix and my kid brother went first and we fell off into the same thing, the same lifestyle that, you know, that we were, that we had were, uh, you know, involved in when mom and my and my aunt came and grabbed us and, and, you know, and mom took us back to Miami, burglaries. But this time my kid brother fell for a burglary. I fell for one and uh, my kid brother flew back to Miami and I stayed in Phoenix. So right. mom didn't really get into the smuggling until around 74, 75. Somewhere around in there, mom, you know, negotiated in Bogota with an individual and uh, she was able to... Uh, um, mortgage out the house and uh, get a boat and then you know and then bring in her first few loads so but but i was by this time i was already in the state penitentiary in arizona right i bought my first harley with the with the uh you what, know what were smuggling you heroin out of mexico what were you in the and what'd you go to the state for burglaries okay yeah how much time did you do did a couple of years had a couple of five year sentences run concurrent did a couple of years and uh you know the uh Got uh, ran prospect for the high wall jammers. My kid brother was a captain in the Aryan Brotherhood. When so, he when he was, he said everybody knew who the high wall jammers were, and we had a race war with the uh, with the the with the the, the blacks. Right. And uh, the Mexican mafia had our backs, and we essentially took over the compound at the time, and uh, they put us that were involved in that riot in 1975 put us on death row because they had nowhere else to keep us, and. Um, that's where we were, and on, on orders from from the president of the uh, of the uh, uh, they were sanctioned by the Aryan Brotherhood out of California. 
the high wall jammers became A, a B. And, but, but we were still high wall jammers at, during that time in 75 under underground lockdown. And, uh, I was, I had to electrocute an individual, set one on fire. And we blew one up with a bomb, three different individuals. And I, and I was the youngest high wall jammer. So they split us up and I, I got a half because I only had five years. So I did two years on the sentence and I was essentially done. Right. So they grabbed me first and then they shot me to a halfway house in Phoenix. And my kid brother rode his Harley. Uh, with a friend of his up to uh, New York, and then he rode all the way out. Um, from the uh, sent me a letter from the Waldorf Astoria on Waldorf Astoria Stationery, and 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 then he rode out to meet me in the hat when I got to got to the halfway house in Phoenix. He convinced you to go back to Miami? No, 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 no. I uh, I stayed in Phoenix. I uh, he was by this time him and mom were bringing in a few loads. They were making a lot more money than they had, you know, than than you know. Initially, they had been making, well, she did a million on those first few loads, but she turned around and, uh, and her and Doug were already bringing in, they had, she had bought a shrimper, a couple of shrimpers, and they were running them down into Cartagena and Barranquilla. And, 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 so, and Doug's, uh, Doug's, Doug's captaining. Doug's captain of the boat and then taking the boat down there and back. And, uh, I stayed in Arizona and rode. My question is that, it, you know, you're, you're in Arizona and, um, your mom brings in the first load and she arranges it with some guys from Atlanta, right? How does that f- first transaction go? Well, um, her friend had set up the, uh, the indict, uh, the, uh, um, stop, start over. <laughs> start to set up the deal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a good friend of hers had met these guys while he was in the, in the uh, federal penitentiary in Atlanta. Right. And uh, so she, he hooks mom up with these these rednecks out of Atlanta and uh, out of Georgia, and they come down to buy the load. And she, uh, they, were in, they were in one motel room at the Old Days Inn on Collins down in South Miami. So she... Uh, she, she, they get a sample. Her friend gives them a sample of the, of the, uh, the pot, right? Yeah, of the uh, the the Colombian gold right. back then. And then, uh, um, she gets a she gets a call from her friend, and he and, and uh, he tells he tells mom, um, and I'm relating the story that she told me. Yeah, and and, and parts of it my kid brother told me. So he says, uh, yeah, they want another sample of it. So they moved to another motel room. So, you know, they're ready to, you know, conduct business. And so what do you want to do? So he says, okay. So she loads it up in two vans, a couple thousand each van and goes down a couple thousand pounds each van and drives down there. And and they, and they leave, she leaves my kid brother down in the parking lot. If I'm not back, back here in a certain amount of time, you will hear, you know who to call in Columbia. And then, uh, she goes upstairs and walks up, you know, walks up there all by herself. And uh, they had moved to another to another suite. So she's a little apprehensive and she's getting, you know, she's being as smart as she was. Just the, the, the alarm bells are going off. And she walks in. The guy answers the door and, you know, ra- uh, you know, kind of raggedy looking rednecks from, you know, I right. imagine they were moving quite a bit of pot up there, but. Bottom line is they uh, answer the door and she she goes in and there's four or five of them around a table I think and uh, the the uh, the guy that was running everything he's sitting there and she tosses him she got her she's got her uh, she always carried a purse that, that slung over her shoulder about, about waist height so she hands him the sample and he starts smoking and then he starts telling stories and you know one thing leads to another and she's there all by herself and they're kind of oogling her. Cause she's, you know, she's extremely beautiful, you know, and uh, so they're, uh, you know, they're talking and kind of, you know, drinking beer and everything. And then he says it's not like the last sample that he had gotten, and and he's having a hard time getting high. And uh, she's been leaning against the the kitchen counter for a better part of uh, half an hour, you know, thir- uh, uh, and that's it. So she, uh, he says, I, I, I'm. You know, I think I'm, I know it's not like the other stuff. I'm, I'm like really get feeling it like I, you know, 
like I did the on um, the other sample you brought. I'm not really getting that getting high, and uh, just kind of thinking that they can just you know kind of handle her because she's a woman, right? And but it's the only shit she has. It's the same stuff. It's the same stuff. So right. she just uh, unzips the purse, pulls out her her uh, hammerless uh, uh, police snub nose, uh, a spe- 38 special, and two quick steps. And leans across the table and sticks the pistol in his ear and and you you know you know what it says in, the, in like in in, yeah, in yeah. devils uh, you better start getting high you motherless cocksucker or I'm gonna splatter your brains all over your ugly redneck part partner's lap right you know so and that's it and so, uh, he starts he he freaks out and uh, you know you could have heard a pin drop and he he starts screaming pay her pay her. And uh, there you go. She walked out of there with the cash and and uh, how much? Do you remember how much? Um, two million or whatever, four thousand pounds, something like that, I guess. And that's it. She paid off the mortgage on that she'd taken out in the house with the boat, the loan shark, and all that kind of stuff, and walked out. And uh, you know, um, nice lick. And uh, yeah, I grabbed my kid brother, and they were gone. And, and and told him they have the keys. They're they're down. The keys are under the front seat, and it's in the parking lot. And the day's in, down there. And you know, but my kid brother had walked. You know, he had gotten a little worried. He's down there. He's young. He's he's all he's all by himself. So you know, you're doing something like this. You don't know, right? Maybe they're waiting for you to pull in, figuring you know, and then they they're, they're going to go. Oh, it must be. In, they might rob him, right? So he's so highly volatile situation in back in them days and that kind of that kind of stuff you know like walking into a hotel room and uh you know doing a deal for a, for a, a few keys and you don't know if they're cops right or you know if it's a rip off and everybody's everybody's strapped so i stayed in arizona and rode built the show winning harley i had a cousin that owned a, a bike shop well-known custom custom bike shop called Cosmic Choppers, Keith Warlock, and he we built a my second uh, Harley, a, another Panhead, and we uh, we won a big show out there, and I rode that for like a year and a year and a half, and then we built another one. I wrecked that and got the insurance money, and we built another one. Actually, I bought it from the mechanic, a shovel head, and I rode that, and then that's the bike, and we won another show on that bike, the San, you know, big show out there in in Phoenix. At the Veterans Memorial Coliseum, and then uh, the Dirty Dozen by that by that time knew who I the Dirty Dozen by that time knew who I was, and they approached me and wanted me to run a prospect for the club, and I eventually on that on that uh, on that uh, uh, shovel head I rode prospect for the Dirty Dozen for the Phoenix chapter and got my patch about 1970, 1974. right or excuse me nineteen seventy seven seventy six. Late 76, early se- got my patch for the Phoenix chapter. Well, I mean, so writing prospect for the Dirty Dozen isn't exactly a W-2 job. What were you doing for a living? It's not, it's not ex- I knew a Hell's Angel that never rode prospect for the Dirty Dozen that never made it. Right. Out of uh, But out I'm of, saying, what were you doing for a living, though? Because I know, I, know just- I was I was number one Harley Davidson motorcycle thief for for almost five, six years in, in, in Phoenix. How Chased many? by two top detectives. For for almost six and a half seven years. Right. What were their names? Because I never I know. Uh, d- uh, there was John Giordano and Jack Hackworth. They were the heads of the uh, motorcycle uh, theft division of the uh, Grand Theft Auto uh, SI SID Special Investigation Department or SID or SIS Special Investigations for. They got me one time. And they right. let they they let me go. They wanted me to 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 cooperate. So I said, yeah, sure, you know. And I got out. And then I never. I, and they said, we want to hear from you by Monday. Well, I think it was a Friday evening, and I went and stole three Harleys up I ten there in Phoenix. And they never saw me again. They put out a warrant for my arrest because they floated the uh, the uh, they couldn't get the individual whose motorcycle I had uh, allegedly stolen to come back from. He was a guy from Alaska. They couldn't get him to come back and testify. So they had to, so drop, they had the to drop the charge. Well, I, 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 the judge gave me a probationary term for a few months. And so, Rossini in the 1990s was a 20-something-year-old Los Angeles-based drug trafficker of ecstasy and ice. He and his associates drove luxury European supercars, lived in Beverly Hills penthouses, 
and dated Playboy models while dodging federal indictments. Then, two FBI officers with the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force entered the picture. Dirty agents willing to fix cases and identify informants. Suddenly, two of Rossini's associates, confidential informants working with federal law enforcement, were murdered. Everyone pointed to Rossini. As his co-defendants prepared for trial, U.S. Attorney Robert Mueller sat down to debrief Rossini at Leavenworth Penitentiary, and another story emerged. A tale of FBI corruption and complicity in murder. You see, Pierre Rossini knew something that no one else knew. The truth. And Robert Mueller and the federal government have been covering it up to this very day. Devil Exposed. A twisted tale of drug trafficking, corruption, and murder in the City of Angels. Available on Amazon and Audible. Tell me the story about, I mean, I know there's a bunch of stories, but tell me the story about stealing the guy's Harley twice. I had a friend who was a, who, who, a junkie named Pat Grafe. Pat essentially told me one day, I would give him uh, 50 bucks on any, any Harley I would grab that he would, he would find. So Pat says, man, there's a guy out there in Paradise Valley that's got a, got a bike and he leaves it out in his backyard in front of his tool shed, but he's got a Great Dane. And the Great Dane sleeps in the tool shed and he just parks it right there on, the, on a concrete slab in front of the tool shed. I said, okay. So we drove out there and looked at it and it was a real nice shovel, kind of customized. So I went back there in the, in, uh, and this is the wintertime in Phoenix. It gets, it gets down to freezing. I went out there and took the, he took the, the Great Dane in the house. And it was so cold. And I went in the backyard and I took the bike. It took me a while. I kind of got stuck trying to bring the bike between the shed and the fence that ran adjacent to the street there. It was about a four foot, uh, a three and a half, four feet width and i uh i miscalculated and once i got between the shed and the chain link fence i realized that i had enough room to get it out of there i had it took me at least 45 minutes to back the truck out or excuse me yeah. we'll have to uh, yeah. the back the i'm thinking in terms of trucking uh, to get the get the the uh, the motorcycle between the shed and the chain link fence to get it into his backyard and roll it out to the alley and then down the street and into another alley and hot wire it uh the bike wouldn't start. I had to kick it over. Well, most of those motorcycles that I was stealing back then, a lot of them were electric start, but this one was a kick, and I and I couldn't get to start. But the, but the, to back up, when Pat and I came out and looked at the bike, he says, "By the way, I saw the bike where it was parked. It was daytime." He goes, "This guy is about six foot freaking eleven, <laughs> six foot ten. He carries a forty four Magnum." And I just kind of and Pat Pat was a skinny little guy. You know, he had a Harley too, and he says. Uh, he says, he says, you think you can, he says, I don't know. I, he says, I've never, I can't imagine how you're going to get that bike that he keeps the dog in the shed. Well, he took the dog in that night. I, you know, you walk by there about three in the morning when, and when they're in their REM sleep, toss a pebble at the shed, no dog comes out. You turn around, you wait a little bit and you go back and you, you know, you hold your, hold your, uh, your nuts and you walk up in there and you try to get the motorcycle without getting blown away. So. I got that bike, took it to a buddy of mine. So you did get it started though. Once oh yeah, you walked I, it yeah, out. yeah, I had to hot wire. I had to go to a Papa the Hood on a guy's uh, uh, um, a, a car that was parked over there at another house along the side. I had to pop the hood. You could tell the car wasn't running like an old Chevy, and take the the wire from the solenoid going to the battery, and about four feet long, and run that from the battery to the solenoid of the motorcycle. And uh, and she finally started. I had overloaded the, the carburetor. I flooded it. But when it ran, it ran like a raped ape. And I took off and took it up to a buddy of mine named Dave, who was fencing all, all most of the motorcycles for me. Little unbeknownst to me, Dave was under surveillance by the Phoenix Police Department, the same two detectives. Who were already looking for you? They were looking for it. Right. No, they had, had no idea who I was. They okay. were looking for Dave. They found Dave, and I went back to get paid for the bike. I called him, and he from my cousin's bike shop. He says, "Come by tomorrow morning. I'll have your money." As I roll, I had an old Polaris, 1964, a Dodge Polaris, and I rolled through there, coming by Dave's house, and looked, and I saw about six or seven um, Phoenix police cruisers, a couple of unmarked uh, detective 
uh, uh, cruisers and a couple of tow trucks, about 20 bikes out in the front yard, and Dave and his girlfriend were cuffed. So I lost the bike. I kept going. So my buddy, I tell my buddy, Patty thinks I'm lying to him. I says, no, nah, man, my, my guy got busted. So about four or five days later, I get a call at my cousin's bike shop. He, my, bro, my cousin Keith, he had a payphone inside the, 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 the bike shop. He says, you got that, that guy, Pat, is on the phone. So I walked through. I said, yeah. He goes, this guy got another motorcycle. I said, what guy? He's the guy that you stole the one from last week. He's got a brand new 80-inch lowrider, a black one. I so said, got the insurance money. So I rolled up there. We took Pat's little Nova and drove over there. And the motorcycles are, we pull up to a Dairy Queen right across the street. And I like, the guy lived on a corner. And I looked over there in the residential neighborhood. I looked over there and I saw two motorcycles in, in the driveway or actually on the front lawn. And uh, me and Pat were sitting there. And uh, I got a chili dog I'll never forget and a Tasty Freeze. Uh, it was a Tasty Freeze or um, I think it was a Tasty Freeze. And I'm sitting there watching it. We smoked a joint. Pat's looking over there and these guys came outside and were walking around. The, the guys knew uh, his biker buddy. His biker buddy was almost as tall as he was. You know, so I'm watching him and Pat's looking over at me and going, man, he says, you'll, you'll never, never get a brand new 80 inch low rider. They had just come out. So it was broad daylight. They went back in the house. Then the, uh, the one individual's buddy came out. They, they stood there and talked. He fired up his bike and left. The, uh, individual that owned the, the you know, that, that owned the motorcycle that I had taken one previously about four days before he went back in the house. Front doors open. I looked over at Pat and I go, watch this action. Pat's jaw dropped, and I walked across the street, up to the up to the corner, and just walked right up on the grass to the motorcycle. I could see the guy's feet up in the ottoman watching uh, Beverly Hillbillies, or it's a, a big valley, or something like that. I walked up to the bike, and very carefully and quietly picked up the kickstand, because they make a noise. If you don't know how to pull it, it's spring-loaded. Right. Pulled it up a lot, you know, put it in neutral and, and froze because he got up one second to change the channel to uh, Gilligan's Island, uh, little buddy, and then flip it back over to whatever he was watching. And I backed it out and whirled it down the street and then cranked it up on about two streets down in an alley. And I roared, I went down that alley and realized that I had hit a dead end. Because that street I rolled out on, I may went to make a left and it says dead end. So I had to make a U-turn. And the only way to get out of there was to ride right past his front door. So I come down the street, crank coming out of second gear into third, about 60, 70 miles an hour. The guy was standing out on his porch. He had a 40, he had his 44, <laughs> his jaw was, was down on, on his belt buckle. And as I ripped past him, the only thing in my mind is, is I'm thinking all he has to do is take, step out in the street. If he's a good shot like I was, he could put one right between my shoulder blades. Right. But it's, you know, and as I went past, I looked at, to my right, looked over at him standing with his, his jaw hanging out over there um, in front of his door. I looked to my left and uh, I looked over, and Pat's jaw is, is, is hanging on his belt buckle. As he watches me, I look over at Pat and I rip by about 70 miles an hour and Pat's jaw is, you know, he's like, he couldn't believe it. It was it was it was, it was crazy. Uh, Pat had looked like he was having a heart attack. As I looked over at Pat, and I finally got to the next street and made a right and rode to Pat's mom's house. The guy didn't fire the gun. No. Okay. And uh, so I got over to Pat's mom. Said he was following me, and I got there. My, Pat's mother had come home from work, and she opened the door by the the gate by the pool, and she looked over at me, and she says, "Oh, hi, Michael." They go, "Hey, Mrs. Grave, how you doing?" And she goes, but you have a different motorcycle every week. She goes, that's a beautiful bike. I said, thank you. And this, it's a friend. I'm just working on it. I'm working yeah. on it for a friend. So I parked it by the pool and then Pat pulled up. And he walks up to, he was white as a sheet. He looked at me and he goes, he says, man, he says, I cannot believe that I just saw what, what I just saw. He says, uh, you had the biggest set of balls than anybody I ever met in my entire life. So I just said, look, you know, because I was still building that chopper that we were, I was still building that bike that me and Keith had, uh, essentially I had bought that motorcycle and Keith talked me into stripping it down. They were going to completely rebuild it for the show that was coming up in about five or six months. So right. there you go. So I was still, I was doing everything I could, burglaries, motorcycles, dealing drugs in order to pay for the bike. And uh, 
Yeah, your cousin. Didn't you say your cousin said it, it was it only cost a few thousand dollars, and it, it just kept every time you walked. Yeah, he in. says, "Oh, it cost about twelve thousand dollars." And at, at that time, in the early in this mid middle seventies, that was a lot of money. And I was, was living with my stepbrother, so but it kept I, getting. I can't believe I, I you higher know, and higher. Oh, it got it, it, yeah, it got up to into the mid thirties before we finally finished the motorcycle and entered it into that show at the Veterans Memorial Coliseum when I won first place, got a big check. Got a big trophy. Keith put it in the showroom and at Cosby Choppers, and he and I had to sign the check over to him because I was into him by that time uh, uh, for about fifteen to seventeen thousand. I always had a huge balance there. So, well, whatever. What happened with uh, Keith? He passed away. Keith died. Yeah. Yeah. When I got my patch in the Dirty Dozen, I've been with a dozen for about a year and went over there. Duke was his partner, the painter. Right. And I uh, went over there and he told me that Keith had died. So, um, he, you know. It was a rough time. It was a rough time then. We were very, very Keith and I were extremely close. I loved him like a, you know, like a like an older brother. Like I love my older brother, who's a Vietnam veteran. Greg still lives in Phoenix. The stepbrother, right? From the you know so, so, um, when you met, uh, you you uh, you got married. Well, I didn't get married, and for a, it was a couple of years later after I got my. Remember that that I had a wreck on that on that panhead. We got the insurance money, and Big Tim, the the mechanic for my cousin, he had that shovel head, and he had it up on uh, up on the workbench. When I came in there one day, I looked at it, and it was out of this world. I go, "What do you want for that?" He goes, "I'll take six thousand in cash." And I said, I'll give you, I'll give you five grand. I'll give you forty five hundred in cash in my motorcycle. And he said, deal, because he wanted around fifteen for it. That was a lot of money then for a chopper. I mean, you know, yeah. you might pay seven, eight grand for a real nice motorcycle. Uh, uh, a stock Harley Davidson out of the dealership was twenty three hundred bucks. Sportster, right. Sportster was like eighteen hundred. You might pay as much as three grand for a for you know a, a limited edition bike like a, maybe a low rider of twenty eight hundred somewhere around in there. So, I we put that in the show again, and it won. First place, big trophy, you know. So I rode that for. Uh, I had a really close friend named Lumpy, whose brother had rode with the Dirty Dozen, Bob Bob Hennessy, Leo Hennessy. We we called him Lumpy, yeah. And he was uh, he was uh, he was eleven, twelve years old, and had his Harley. When we were he he went to a. Uh, a Catholic school next door to where I went to went to grade school in Desert View in North Phoenix. We used to see him riding by on his on his chopper, and he was a pretty, you know, he was a pretty uh, well known individual. We became very very close, and um, lived together. So, so what was happening with your mom? Like at this point, your mom was was actually was sending up, um, was uh, shipping up um, marijuana right for the. For these guys to sell. Mom and Doug were going to Columbia by this time on shrimpers. Doug was they were taking they had a they had a couple of other other individuals that they were working with, but they were they were either flying it in or you know, but most of the time it was coming in on boats. And Doug was bringing in loads from Cartagena, from Barranquilla, and uh Um, I'm still out out west uh, on the bike. All right. So I didn't get. I didn't ride Prospect on that on that third Harley for the Dirty Dozen until around 1977, and got my got my patch in the Phoenix chapter. So I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I started going to this popular college bar called the Squeeze Box, and that's where I met. Why well, I, I walked in there one night with a with a, a member of the club that had gotten busted down to Prospect, named Turtle, and he said one night I took him away from. You know, when you're a prospect, they'll keep you up for days, and it's it's brutal. And I, I gotta tell you, it's brutal. Uh, a boot camp ain't nothing compared to being a prospect for the Dirty Dozen back in the seventies. I, I, as I said, I knew a Hell's Angel that never made it. Met him years later, and the Dirty Dozen minimum prospect uh, is sixty days. If you don't have your patch in seventy or eighty days, something's wrong. They're either gonna beat your ass and take your motorcycle, or just run you out of town. And I, this Hell's Angel, obviously, uh, um, uh, who, who I forget his name. He he uh, essentially realized he wasn't going to get his patch, and he took off. and And Hell's Angels prospect period is a year, 
and so he ran he ran prospect for the for the Hell's Angels. I forget if it was the Purdue chapter or the Daily City Boys or or up there in Oakland. But I met the, the Hell's Angels used to come to Arizona, and part, we were real tight with them. And I knew quite a few of them. So we, me and my president, years later, and one of the warlords, our vice president, we used to fly over and stay with the HA in their, you know, and and party at their their clubhouse in Oakland. So, so I, I have a had at this point, like by the time you meet your wife, had you already gone to federal prison? Because you already went to state. We talked about state. But. I did the state time. No, I hadn't gone. I didn't go to federal uh, the the federal prison until uh 81 and 82 oh yeah 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 okay 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 so um i and, met i met her and that's for stealing like track like massive like tractors and right well it was it, it, a couple of million interstate transportation we would take a a, a a truck like i drive now with a flatbed or we called it a low boy you'd go to a job site find a brand new case grader or a or a backhoe Put it on the the flatbed and run it across the state line before the contractor that owned the 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 the, uh, the equipment would come to work and realize that someone had broken into his yard and stolen, you know, right. one of his. Uh, usually, we would take his prize Kenworth or Peterbilt and use that to go grab. Sometimes, in, uh, the contractor had a had had the equipment on the back of his trucks in the at at the uh, at the yard where he owned his business. So I had to cut the locks, and and uh, this is after uh, she and I had split up, right? So I'm well, uh, well. Let's well let's jump back to so you meet you you meet what's your name? Chris. Chris. You meet Chris, she, who was engaged to someone else, right? And uh, you know I was pretty much was he like a pilot or something or yeah he, yeah he was going to an air college at Bisbee and uh, she was dancing down down there at that club, and the mother had married a wealthy guy. And who had a million dollars was called Sun Valley Awning, I think, as I recall. And you know, so, but she was uh, wasn't having anything to do with me, right? But uh, I was I was essentially smitten, you know. So, but at the time I was living with a, I had uh, like a lot of a lot of the brothers in the club had prostitutes, if you will, or massage parlor um, employees that that uh, that you know that that were bringing in money. Right, you know that's 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 it's, it's almost like the Italian mob. You got prostitution, drugs, right? Uh, you know when Sonny Barger bonded out in a million dollars, that's when the RICO statute came out, and they knew they wait a minute, they have a million dollars cash, and Sonny Barger got bonded out, and uh, you know they they put um, the Italian mob first under that RICO statute, and they and they also and they and the and the feds put in outlaw motorcycle gangs as the second highest priority. Right. for investigation so when they realize these just aren't regular just outlaw greasy bikers they're they posted a million dollars cash bail yeah it's obviously it's a it's it's a it's an enterprise yeah by running. the time i was gone i was in miami uh uh sonny barger had throat cancer he moved to cave creek because of the, uh, the the dry climate and then they a lot of the dirty dozen uh my old brother in the mesa chapter chico robert moore he died but uh by this time i was in miami and so yeah, well, so they, Chris, well, so back to Chris. So yeah. you you meet Chris, you get married. You, she leaves. She leaves the fiance. Right. We we meet the mother. We meet the the mother in law. Um, you know, Chris Chris has me go over to their expensive uh, uh, town home where they're living for dinner. And uh, by this time, I had a go fast jet bike. I had stripped down the shovel head to put an S and S kit in it. You know, essentially born stroke it. And I turned around and I'm driving it riding a jet bike. Right, and I remember Hell's Angel looking at that thing. We were building rice rockets and putting them into rigid frames like a chopper, but it was a, it was a eleven hundred Kawasaki, you know. And um, he told me, he says, "Man, your Harley's going to get back at you for this." And a guy turned left in front of me a few months later, and it was a bad wreck. And uh, this time, I didn't get any insurance money like I always did when I wrecked when I you know would drop one of my one of my motorcycles. So anyway, uh, yeah, we got married, and then. Moved into a house and she kept dancing and uh, I got in that wreck and then we flew back to my, my mother. I called mom and she started sending me quite a bit of money through Western Union every week. So by this time, mom, mom's and she, she had told me, you know, we learned basic seamanship when we had lived there in Miami for a year. You and Doug. Yeah, right. Especially my brother. So we knew basic seamanship. She wanted me to come home. 
She wanted me to add, see, we, me and Chris got married uh, 79, 80. We flew to Miami for our honeymoon. Then that's when, you know, flew into Miami. And I was pretty, I needed an operation. I was pretty messed up from the wreck. And uh, she and I got married and flew into uh, to Miami. And then mom had a home on the ocean. And, you know, we had lived in another, uh, essentially another property that her sugar daddy years before when we first went, came to Miami in 73 in uh, Miami Shores. And this was still Miami Shores, but it was right there on the intercoastal. So then I kind of realized when I came, came to the, came in the house, there were 80 pound bales of, uh, you know, four car garage, three, four car garage, 80 pound bales stacked up along the walls. And I had told my wife it was fertilizer for her, her botanical, you know, garden that she had out back and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, a few days later, yeah, we partied for a good, better part of two weeks. And, you know, a lot of coke. All right. Back in the old days, Pablo stuff, Griselda stuff, you know. The, and uh, back back in the day when it was 93% in, you know, ether, the, the, the good stuff. So we were, and, and, and I had been in Arizona for quite, for so long since I had come back in 73. By this time, it's 79. And uh, my mom had pulled me aside and she says, your brother, listen, the heroin. You know, Doug had, by that time was had was Doug was a multimillionaire when he was eighteen. Right. So you know they uh, nineteen. So the she says you got to come home. I need you got to you got to come home. She was afraid he was going to kill himself, right? Like he was going to end oh, up yeah. over, over, overdose so, or something. And uh, they were bringing the loads, and and some and some Italians were coming down from New York or wherever, and they would take the load. You know, they would mom would flip the load to them, and uh, the Colombians were fronting the load. They were front mom the load, and then you know she would. Uh, they had come down. She'd flip it for a percentage for for a nice profit in a few million, two three million, whatever five. And then uh, the she would pay the Colombians, and she was getting it pretty cheap, of course, you know. And then uh, that's that's the that's the way it was running. So, but I told you know, so, but Chris wanted to go back to work in uh, Phoenix, so she flew back before me, and then I stayed in Miami. And we, uh, me and my kid brother and some, some real close friends, we, we took a little, Doug says, let's go out in the boat and go to Nassau. So we went to Nassau and gambled, you know, and it was, those days were pretty decadent. Had about, uh, had a pound of Coke on the boat. There was the, the friend's, uh, father's, uh, uh, um, sport fish, a uh, Hatteras, or excuse me, a, uh, Bertram, a, f- a 53 foot Bertram. And we took that to the, uh, to the Bahamas for about a week and a half. Two weeks we were on the uh, you know at sea, so it was a nice vacation for me. Right to get away. But Chris, using forgeries and bogus identities, Matthew B. Cox, one of the most ingenious con men in history, built America's biggest banks out of millions. Despite numerous encounters with bank security, state, and federal authorities, Cox narrowly and quite luckily avoided capture. For years. Eventually, he topped the U.S. Secret Service's most wanted list and led the U.S. Marshals, FBI, and Secret Service on a three year chase while jet setting around the world with his attractive female accomplices. Cox has been declared one of the most prolific mortgage fraud con artists of all time by CNBC's American Greed. Bloomberg Business Week called him the mortgage industry's worst nightmare while Dateline NBC described Cox as a gifted forger and silver-tongued liar. Playboy magazine proclaimed his scam was real estate fraud, and he was the best. Shark in the Housing Pool is Cox's exhilarating first-person account of his stranger-than-fiction story, available now on Amazon and Audible. I went back to Phoenix, so I didn't follow her for a couple of weeks, and then... Uh... Uh, you know, a few things went down and I had a little bit of cash and I flew back in to Phoenix and, you know, by that time I had quit the club and because the, you know, the, the motorcycle, uh, the, the injury from that wreck, I've been down about 50 or 20 times and, and during my tenure riding all those years, but the, I had three major wrecks and the third was a charm. Like they say in Vietnam, three in a match, the third one was the worst. And it was pretty debilitating, and I needed an operation. So mom volunteered to pay for it, but you got to come home to Miami. 
Right. I want you to, and I told her, mom, Chris doesn't like Miami. And my mom's essentially, in my mother's exact words, yeah, dump that flaky bitch. Right. And uh, mom, mothers know, and, and get your ass back home and get on the boat. So, so she basically wanted you, you and your brother to captain the boats to go pick up marijuana. So mom could live her, 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 uh, her, um, luxurious lifestyle exactly right. <laughs> hey listen she was the brains mom the feds were never ever the dea the fbi they were never able to outsmart her never so that's the bottom line was she was alive you know we had a lot of heat years, right. years later they had a lot of heat and uh you know they were i would sit there at the house at night you know um high uh, you know a uh, high on, on on blow and sit there and watch a, a car go. She had a boyfriend that that uh, she met a younger kid and his father was a uh, a boss in the Gambino family. Right, Joe Paterno. So they you'd see a car go by. A couple of Joe's uh, button guys would drive by. Then you'd see another car go by about an hour later with a uh, uh, undercover uh, vehicle with the short wave aerials. And you see another one like that one go by at about an hour later. I would sit there at night and watch four or five cars go by in a five or six hour period. So, you know, we were under heavy surveillance, but mom just said, no, we're going to take the, we're not going to offload over here at the warehouse. We usually bring it up here in the intercoastal here in Miami. We're going to bring it down to the Keys, you dumb asses. We're going to offload it there and bring it up in trucks right under their noses. And we got another warehouse. And so, you know, we were never, never busted for any load ever right. by the, you know, although they tried to get mom, they did, they did come in the house. Uh, which uh, I believe when we were in Coleman, you pulled, you you yeah, yeah. you got that the indictment. My mom was indicted uh, for uh, uh, cocaine in 1975 in, right. in in Miami. She got it quashed, or she brought her the way to no, the Supreme she Court. She took it to the Supreme Court. Yeah, and there was a corrupt judge named Ellen Morphonius. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. she tried to extort mom for ten grand, and then mom was a little. It said some derogatory things about Morphonius, and the phone was tapped. Yeah, on the phone. Yes. So on the phone, she says, she's she's mouth. She's they had a uh, well, it was a bail bondsman, right? The, the bail bondsman came and said that Morphonius wants detectives. Oh, okay. They, they want they gave 10 the, grand. They, they gave the tape. They wanted ten initially. They wanted ten thousand, and then uh, um, mom was pretty upset about that and then she said a few derogatory things about morphonius and that but came, she said it on the phone like she knew the phone was tapped and she still called up what uh she was talking Angie? to one of her gangster friends right and she's yeah on so, the phone. Uh, yeah so, uh, some wise guy and it came back and the detectives came back over and played the tape for her and says now morphonius wants a hundred thousand dollars my my kid brother's in, yeah. in, out in California at this time. Doug had Dougie had to help raise the hundred G's to give to Morphonius because Morphonius said it's a hundred thousand. Now that, remember, this is the seventies. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of money in the mid seventies. That's a lot of money now. But yeah, yeah, you can well, imagine back then. That's so, like yeah, half a so million they, dollars. So uh, they raised the money and gave it to uh, um, that corrupt piece of <laughs> right. So work and. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, invective uh, vernacular. Anyway, so make a long story short, um, or uh, the, the the detectives initially told mom it's a hundred grand or you're going to prison. So she she quashed the case, but mom took it to the Supreme Court, and that's what you pulled up when we were in Coleman, right? And you know, Marlene Hudson, aka the lady, the lady, yeah. So versus the state of Florida, um, so. I was what at this point. So when is that? Well, this that's seventy five, but we were up to about seventy nine. When did Doug get grabbed? Because he got grabbed twice. Doug got grabbed in the Bahamas on a load, and uh, he got grabbed the first time. And the Bahamians took Doug into the Fox Hill, right? And they, uh, um, I was still in Arizona then, but I didn't, you know, so. Uh, Fox Hill was like an, uh, an infamous, infamous. Uh, prison, right? In, in, the, in Bahamas. the Bahamas, like horrible yeah, it was, conditions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, probably just as bad, if not worse, the, uh, the uh, as Combinado del Este, where Doug wound up in prison in Cuba 
in 83. Right. When I had already came home from that federal prison camp right. for, so, the, for the two million in, in interstate transportation. So what happened with, so he's he's in the Bahamas. Mom calls the Colombians and says, Doug's in the, the in, in, in Fox Hill. The Colombians go to the, the essentially the story that was given that, that, that Dougie gave me and mom, they, the Colombians went to the jailer. I got to a jailer in the Bahamas and said, we'll give you a 50 G's, 25 now and 25, uh, you know, when you, when the kid comes, when the kid comes home, we'll have a cigarette sitting down there in the, in the, in the marina. Right. So sit there. So they put a cigarette boat, the Colombians put a cigarette boat in the marina and the prison guards let him out. Like they let him escape. They, Leave a door open. Ascent, they- ascent, uh, uh, apparently, one individual that they were able to get to. Right. And uh, but this individual decided he was going to keep the money and his job, and gave gave up Doug. And when Doug got in that, in those days, you had to open, you had to run the blowers, you had to open up the the blowers on the boat to get all the gas fumes out of it. Otherwise, you could go up like a like a like a Roman candle. All right. So Doug's in. Doug got down to the marina, got in the boat, and. Uh, here comes a, uh, could have been a Hatteras or a Bertram that they had confiscated, converted with a thirty caliber or a fifty up on deck, with a with a five thousand can of power searchlight, and you know, so Doug just took off. He didn't even know, and he took off, didn't even run the blowers for a minimum of three minutes, and took off, and uh, they opened up on him, and there was quite a few holes in the boat. Doug made it to Fort Lauderdale, and you know, that was it. And uh, from to my knowledge, the Colombians found out that the jailer had double crossed him, and he never had a chance to spend that money. All right. So you know. So then, so basically, you co- So what happens with you? You come back. You come back to Miami. Uh, what happened with Chris? Well, Chris, I came back home, and we were together for about a year, and it got to the point where Mom told me finally, "Listen, you're coming home. I need you need to come home." And get on the boat because Doug is going to kill himself. He's going right. to OD. So his heroin problem had gotten a little out of hand. But listen, I had had the same. I had done the same thing, but I had essentially kicked it back in '73. You know when I when I bought that first Harley. So uh, he, uh, you know, was really giving mom fits, and uh, the whole operation could you know because. They would get a hundred thousand dollars up front as a captain's fee before he ever got in the boat. The you know the people the the Italians that were buying the marijuana were, were giving Doug a captain's fee, and that would essentially cover any expenses that may that they might incur in case he got interdicted. You know the the Coast Guard boarded him, or he wound up in a foreign prison somewhere, right? So they could get him out, like he did winding up when Castro got him. So. Um, and, and I told mom, Chris hates Miami. She doesn't want to go back there. And then, you know, she said, get rid of her. Uh, so, but I wasn't, I was, I, I loved her. I didn't want to leave, right. you know? And, uh, so mom essentially had been sending me quite a bit of money and I still needed to get that operation. So she kind of cut me off. Right. So we wound up just living together and she was still dancing at that club and I was doing a few things. I was still stealing Harleys here and there and doing a burglary here or there. And, uh, I put together a score. Um, her mother, her the mother-in-law, was a uh, quite the quite the hater. And <laughs> the fact that when Chris came home from her honeymoon, they never got along together. And Chris had told me one time that they had gotten a fight and put each other in the same hospital room in separate beds across from each other. And I was like, you know, Chris was a beautiful, beautiful woman, but she was tough. It's about five nine, you know, five so. Uh, um, she was a, definitely a, a, a 10. So anyway, we we would fight on occasion. And uh, I put together a score that, that my good friend Lumpy had uh, run across. He did a, he was a carpenter at Excellent. I used to work, I hammer nails with him and frame houses years before when we were when we were younger. And uh, he said, yeah, he did a he did a room addition for this real wealthy Jewish guy that owns our jewelry store. And he's building a bigger jewelry store, so all of his inventory is in an alarmed uh, part of the property, you know, about five thousand square feet. And he and Lumpy essentially gave me a layout of the, uh, and we went over there, and I sold a little bit of gold to the guy, and I got a, you know, I, and I and did a little recon, you know, and, and saw it was heavily alarmed proximity, you know, LEDs on the doors, um, 
tape on the windows. And as we're driving away in Lumpy's Porsche, he says to me, and we're smoking a joint. I'm just staring out the window. And Lumpy looks over me. He knows what I'm thinking. He goes, no, there's no way. There's no way you're going to be able to. Don't even think about it. I go, you know, there's, he says, I says to him, I says, you know, there's got to be about 17 or 18 pounds of, of gold. Gold was at $550 an ounce then. It was the highest it had ever been. And, and, and hanging on the walls, just in chains and diamond pendants and, uh, you know, displays, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, for all, Cartier, Rolex, blah, 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 with all the diamond rings. So Lumpy goes, forget about it. You're not going to, you'll never get, he says, you could try going up in the attic and cr- crawling across the, uh, the the home into the guest house where, where everything was being kept under, you know, the whole, the whole property was heavily alarmed and uh, you could jump through the drywall. And I thought about that for a minute. And then and I tried that one night. You know, that I would I would scope the the the, uh, the residence, and the individual was gone. You know, there were two cars a driveway, a new Mercedes diesel, and a and a Eldorado. So I knew he had a wife and a couple of kids, and I went back there and tried that. Tried to move the attic enclosure up about two inches, and the alarm went off. So I told Lumpy, oh, "Listen, you idiot! There's this this is proximity." So what I did was eventually get a schematic of the of the uh, alarm system. And I went back there. The guy went on vacation. I just happened to get lucky. So I went in. And it took eight hours. It was one of the hottest nights in Arizona history. It was 108 degrees at uh, 8 or 9 o'clock at night. It was like 101, 102. I had a young kid whose girlfriend worked at the squeeze box with Chris. And I went in there. And it took about eight hours. I cut the alarms. I, I essentially, uh, you know, um, Disengaged the uh, the 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 external system, the audible system, the striker, the, and it had special tools, and then cut cut the glass, uh, like like Mar- Jack Murphy did with the India Star Sapphire, uh, the the long ruby, and uh, back in the day. But mine were a little my my entry was a little more professional, and I tied off the alarm system. This is the tape, and I got in, and uh, <clears throat> I told this kid, listen, it was a cul-de-sac. So you had an alley, and then you had to run around the side of the home. It had a pool. Had a uh, it was about five thousand square feet. It had a big swimming pool. I says, tap on that side window if you see any police coming down. There's only one way to get in. Right, coming down the street. It was at the end of that street at a cul-de-sac, off of Glendale Avenue and Twelfth Street. So, uh, as I stepped up to the room where all the inv- where all the inventory was. I could actually feel this. It was glowing red and feel the, the uh, almost a hum, an audible hum from all the service that was being run in there. And I, you know, had a ski mask on and you could see the LEDs across the doorway on the uh, two feet up, a foot up. And then from, you know, so that the light emitting diode would, it would trip the alarm. So you had to dive between them. So I threw the duffel bag in there, dove between them, stood up and, uh, as soon as I stood up, they had a backup system that wasn't on the schematic, and the damn thing would it, the the alarm system was sold out. It woke the dead. Right. So it had to have wake woken up at least five square blocks. But you're already in. The kid left me. It scared him to death. <laughs> but I was in, and I wasn't leaving. And in Arizona, then burglaries were prosecuted for uh, you had had a a window of maybe five to eight minutes. Before they were, they were the the Phoenix Police Department burglaries were heavily prosecuted, and I went away on. And, and a, you've already been yes to prison. So a second me. offense carried a min man of fifteen. Yeah, and I had been doing them all along when I built the motorcycles, you know. So, you know, I had the I had the uh, the butterflies the whole time I was doing burglary. I did some high end burglaries when I was building the first the you know, the second pan head. You know, and uh, that Keith conned me into building. Um, so uh, the alarm went off, and I stayed in there. I looked at my watch. I was in there for nine minutes. I got every last bit of inventory and got out, got stuck coming out the window because there was just this tiny pane that I had cut to open. the, you know, the These windows cranked open, but I tied off the alarm, you know, with the alligator clips and... Uh, all that kind of jazz, and it, 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 it didn't matter because all that time I took, 
you know, it was immaterial because I set off a backup system. Right. So by this time, you can hear voices of the neighbors. In fact, the neighbors did come outside one time when I was on a two-story ladder. That I used, the neighbor that the the individual that uh, that owned that property. I used his two-story to go up and 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 uh, um, disengage the audible system with the bell and the striker. I took that all apart, but there was another one inside the attic. Anyway, I got out of there and made it back to the. Uh, we had parked across a main a, pro, uh, a main thoroughfare, Glendale Avenue, and an apartment complex parking lot right there. And I went and uh, walked back through, and got and this kid was sitting in his Jeep, and it, I had about thirty pounds, 40, 40 pounds. Gold, diamonds, you know, and watches, you name it. And I threw it in the back of his Jeep. He never knew I had it. And I got it. And my little brother wanted to kill him when right. he found out. Because my little brother, just, my they had essentially uh, helped me with this, how, how to tie out the system because I was not a cat burglar per se. Right. I did burglaries, but I was the more of the uh, Jimmy the door with a crowbar, uh, right. vice grips, you know, get in, get out. And, you know, so, but this one was a little different. So we waited, and about 20 cars come up with the lights flashing, and the helicopter was already over the property with the searchlight. But it was, but the pro- I watched the helicopter go across. This property was west of us, and I noticed it went across 12th Street, which we were sitting on, facing north, and Glendale ran east-west. And we were right there on the south uh, eastern corner of 12th Street, right on the street, and I'm watching, and the cops are making a left as they went up. There was a canal that runs around Phoenix, and they had made a left. And I'm looking over at this kid, and I says, uh, "I says they went the wrong way." So we just sat there for a while, and uh, and waited. Then they finally came back across 12th Street and went the right direction. And I says, "Let's get out of here." So that was it. You know, I went back home, woke up Chris. You know, she uh, and then and and this kid. Uh, you know, I was a little upset that he left me there. And I says, "Where's all the tools? They had all my prints on them." Right. Snap on a, a you know a roll out valise, you know Velcro uh, uh, that I that I used to you know the, the glass cutter everything had my pre kills I threw it in the alley. I had to go back there the uh, early the next morning and find the the toolkit that had all my prints on it and get that. So you know we fenced off the stones just the stones alone. I went and I hitchhiked down 12th Street and uh, went to to a Coulter Cadillac and bought a bought a brand new Seville cash. And roll back up. You know, this is 1970, yeah, uh, yeah. 1979, 80, 80. And then, you know, and then we moved the gold. It took a while. But Chris had come home on our honeymoon a year and a half before and had told her mother everything. Because one morning at, in Miami, she woke me up. He says, I went out and helped your mom do the laundry. And, oh, we smoked some of that fertilizer. So... <laughs> Um, and, I'm, and, I, and I said, oh my, I says, oh shit. I says, look, I, we better, we better have a talk. Right. So I told her his mom's a smuggler. I says, what do you mean? I says, uh, she brings in, you know, large amounts of marijuana on boats from Colombia. So Chris went back and she never got along with her mother and they essentially hated each other and she liked to really just get under her mom's skin. So she told her everything. Oh, Michael, you think you're wealthy? Her mom, she says, Michael's mom cleans house in a nine carat marquee diamond. So you think we're wealthy? So her mother's threatened to go to the police. And I had to call my mom and tell her who left the call back and left the message on our answering machine when Chris and I came back from the club one night because she'd go dance and I'd just go in the club and, you know, drink, play foosball, right. Galaga, you know. And uh, sit there and watch her dance. And then we would go across the street to, uh, to like a Denny's, was called a Carol's, have breakfast and go home. And uh, she says, uh, my mom says, Michael, it's your mother. She says, uh, tell, your, tell your wife that if her mother goes to the police, I'll have her killed. And that pretty much put the kibosh on her mom going to the cops. Right. So, and it kind of, our marriage was a little... It was just look, you know the mother. It was the mother-in-law. She was right in the middle of it. She just she couldn't help but but just try to just disrupt the whole thing. You know, we loved each other, you know. But but I I I feel this way. Chris did the right thing because she when when we did when I did that score, 
it got us on our feet. You know, she turned around and she went and told her mom and she says, the cops are going to come in that condo that you two live in. And when they're going to take you to jail along with him. But she and I started arguing about something and then she eventually, uh, you know, she eventually uh, took off. Right. So by that time I had, uh, I, uh, you know, I ended up meeting Johnny Patterson and we started stealing the heavy equipment and I moved out of there real quick to try to cover my tracks into a, a luxurious condo, bought an Eldorado to match my silver Seville brand new. And that's what I was doing. Right. And I, I dropped, you know, by this time I went underground, you know, and uh, started doing the, 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 the disco thing. So, you know, we're doing the disco deal and that's, that's, that's essentially what, how my lifestyle then it was discos in Phoenix and uh, cocaine and discos. You know, and and flipping a pound of coke here, and you know, uh, a couple of pounds of pot there. Was your mom still moving? Oh yes, just marijuana, or had she switched to coke? No, they didn't start. They didn't go to, to the cocaine until I came home. You know, okay. yeah, because the, the, the there was a lot of heat with the federal government on the marijuana when they when they. Uh, you essentially think of the terms, think of the movie Scarface when Tony's telling, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, um, Alex, he's telling him, hey, you know, the, you, the this is not a that, this is not a cakewalk anymore with the new, you know, spy in the sky uh, technology. The the feds had the floor, the four were looking infrared radar, the look down, shoot down radar, which is which is uh, essentially the same technology they had in the F-14s and the Tomcats then. Right. That look down, shoot down, you know, the infrared signature of a boat, the wake signature would give it away. It's running hot. They could see it. It's, it's bright red. They knew it wasn't, you know, that it was low in the water. And they would contact a, a Coast Guard cutter and say, uh, you might want to check this boat out. Here's the coordinates. See? So you had to really know where the where the Coast Guard was at. Mom knew. She They had the grid system. They knew where they were, pretty much where they ran and what times of the year, you know. But remember, you got a window. You got a you got a window to go to Columbia. You got hurricane season. Any kind of storm out there. We had a friend that named uh, Doyle that got lost out there with a kid that Doug grew up with in Arizona. They went to grade school together. They were best friends. He, he brought him out to Miami, put him on the boat, and uh, Hurricane David caught him. Right. And they were never seen again. So. And this was running a load for your mom. They y- loaded yeah, it up. Yeah, and uh, um. I was still in Arizona then. I was still, I, me and Chris were living together and I was still in the dozen. And I had to go convince the kid's mom not to go to the, the feds or go to the, uh, I said, uh, I said, mom's trying to find out where, if he, if they got interdicted and they're in a foreign prison someplace. Right. So, you know. But you think it was a, a hurricane? We knew it was a hurricane. All right. Yeah. But that was the story we had to give the kid's mom. Right. You know, she didn't, she knew nothing about the boats unless he had told her, but she never did the poor. She was a junkie herself. The kid was a junkie. Right. But Doug got him out to Arizona, got him out to Florida, dry him out and took him from Arizona to Miami. And, uh, the, I guess, you know, like uh, the impact of Doug pretty, pretty, pretty tough because the kid wound up. That's, that's a, you know, that's not a good way to die right. going down in a hurricane. You know, you think of the movie, uh, um, what is the name of that movie? The, uh, with great, Wahlberg. It's a, it's a great remember? movie. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, the Perfect Storm? The Perfect Storm. The Perfect Storm. Think about that. Yeah, going down like that. You're you're fighting for, what, a day? It might take a day. It might take eight hours. No telling how long it takes for that boat to go down to Davy Jones. So that's it. So I... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry for me. The, the references are, I can see the boat going up. You know, and I imme- as soon as you said Davy Jones, I immediately see Fires of the Caribbean with Davy Jones, where he's got the the squid. Sorry, <laughs> I mean, there you go. So um, you know, so me and Johnny Patterson started stealing the heavy equipment. Two brothers that I had known when I was an outlaw biker. I got in a lot of fights in North Phoenix, and they were bouncers at a club called the the uh, Foggy Bottom, and I beat a guy up in there pretty bad. So I had fifty or sixty hand to hand combats in uh, when I was a dirty dozen. And, uh, you know, I got in a lot of fights before that because essentially the Dirty Dozen, I started hanging out with them. They, they would call you a leaner, you know, and uh, the ones that weren't, cl- weren't, weren't in the club because the Dozen owned Arizona. 
and they are they had they had ran fifteen or more outlaw motorcycle gangs out of Arizona, killing them in shootouts. Uh, you know, you name it. Um, when I was still in grade school, the Dirty Dozen took over and and owned Arizona like the HA owned California. Right. So, uh, you know, um, you were boosting trucks or the um, yeah we were we were uh, these two brothers were bouncers at this club and they introduced me to John at a party one night. They lived in a nice, pretty much a nice a home, pretty much like. You know, like like you you ran here. Right. And I came in there and I said, and then one's driving a new Corvette and one's got a new four wheel drive truck, and I'm thinking they're not doing too badly. Right. And it was a high end neighborhood. They're not doing too badly for being bouncers, because I was still riding my bike. Right. And uh, we went to a, a, a to a party and uh, a, a kegger, and there was this guy in there, another guy, uh, and his brother were terrorizing all these two or three hundred kids there. One guy, the, the 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 taller of the brother was a, of the, bro, the two brothers was about six foot ten, six nine if he was an inch, and the other one was about six four, six five, and uh, went outside with some dudes, got in their in their a van to do a you know to do a bump, and we were in there and we heard a bunch of noise, and they were going around pinching all the girls in the ass, and they were across the street and under a street light, and had these three or four guys out there backed up, you know, across the street, and then this guy wakes says, "Hey man, that's some two guys that are." Uh, you know, walking around the party. So I went outside and I said, hey man, calm down. Everybody be cool. And I'm just starting to come on this blow. And anyway, the, uh, the one of them, come, I just kind of touched him on his elbow and he kind of swung back at me. And he had, these were sidewalk commandos. These are the guys that are wearing Harley uh, 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 jackets, but they don't have any motorcycles. My bike was parked right on the on the front lawn of that, of that kegger and I was wearing my patch. Right. And, uh, um, it, I just, you know, I leaned back, you know, and I was trained by a, by a Golden Gloves champion in, in the state prison in Arizona named Bobby Golden out of Oregon. So I was pretty, really, really good with my hands. And I leaned back a little bit, but the tip of his zipper caught me in my lip as he, as he backhanded at me. Get your hands off me, man. So I ran him down and knocked him out. Had to run him down. He tried some karate stuff and all that jazz, and I just, you know, he, you know, blocked the kick, blocked his, all of his kicks, and I ran up on him and knocked him out with a hook. Well, the brother ran up on me. I heard him running up. He left these other four guys and ran up on me, and I hit him with an overhand, and he went right down. And I thought, you know, I heard a little noise like you're pouring a beer out. Right. Slope. And by that time, we could hear the sirens coming, and the, the Higgins brothers, ones that years uh, about a year and a half later, ratted me and Johnny out. Well, see, they got busted for, for, for coke twice, and they had been stealing the heavy equipment with John. That's how they're able to afford that house. They had been, steal, been with John stealing the heavy equipment. They got busted, and they and they're both snitches. Right. So I had thought about coming back to Arizona and killing them both. Years later, my mom said, put, put a stop to that. No, no, we don't need that kind of heat. But it would have been, a, a, it would have been simple. Cause we were, you know, we were highly trained in that, in that kind of thing. Cause you know, all the guys, all the gangsters that mom knew and all this kind of crap, we knew how to get rid of somebody. They were never seen again. So, um, so I turned around and, uh, we ran to their house and the cops came and not to get off on a tangent, but, but about it, two years later, I had a buddy named, named, I'm not going to mention his name, but he was coming out to Miami, getting a, uh, getting a, a couple of pounds of Coke and taking it back to Phoenix. We went out there. By this time, Chris had left, and I was living, you know, over there in that in a in a luxury condo. We went. He bought a new Jeep. We went out to the river, went four wheels with these guys. Uh, we saw some guys doing four wheel, and they had another one of those kind of vans. And, hey, you want to come in and have a drink? And hey, nice Jeep, blah blah. We went in there, so we're sitting there, and there's about four or five of us in there. And my my buddy was very very clandestine. He was very close lipped and very professional. He was rather well to do with the operation he was running between Miami and and uh, you know and Phoenix and one of these guys pipes up and says hey man I know you I hey you were at that at that party with the Higgins brothers you knocked those two brothers out because everybody came out in the front lawn when it happened and started clapping right so then we hear the cops coming and and the and the, the Higgins brothers go we better get out of here so we went to their house and hid even though the cops knew where, where they were at they we saw them driving by all night. So we essentially sat in there and did coke all night and just peeked to the curtains and watched the cops coming back and forth in front of the house. 
He goes, I said, no, 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 you got me missed because my hair was cut, it was you know, and uh, the beard, uh, the the you know the Fu Manchu it was all gone and clean shaven. He goes, no, no, it's you. I go, no, man, it's not me. And Scott's looking over at me, going, hey, man, whoa, hey. And I said, listen, no, you got you got me messed up with somebody else. The guy goes, no, man, it's you. So finally, I go, okay, okay. I says, yeah, it was me. He goes, man, you were in the Dirty Dozen. I says, ah, that was a while back, not anymore. So I says, by the way, I says, Scott goes, I think we should leave, you know, because he was really close-lipped and he didn't want any kind of notoriety at all. I go, look, I says, so what happened with that guy? He goes, he says, you cut an artery in his cheek. He almost bled to death. He lost like three quarts through his cheek before they got into the emergency room in the ambulance. So I, I was I was just like, you know, but. Uh, Touch a bullet. Yeah, so um, that was, that's the kind of, you know, that's the kind of, that's how it was in the, in the club. It, it wasn't, a week didn't go by, it seems. I couldn't avoid it. So that's what was going on when I, when I, when I, I spotted Chris at that club. And I kind of started getting away from, from well, the president of my chapter got really upset. I was his protege. He was grooming me to become a warlord. But I didn't, after a couple of years of that, Matt, two years, three years of it, I really didn't want to do that anymore. I really wanted something different. When I saw her and got to know her, I had this wild, I, I had this hooker that was bringing me $500 a night. She worked at a massage parlor. Uh, a girl, a lady named Paula, a little older than me, a couple of kids, but we lived together. And me and Rabbit, the president of the Tucson chapter, he had a girl that worked with her. And we were, me and Rabbit were really, really, really tight. And we had a little safe house uh, in Phoenix nobody knew about. So that's where we were ensconced and that's where we lived. And, but at the same time, you know, I really didn't, that, that dozen lifestyle, it started to get, I, there was only a matter of time before you wound up going back to the state prison. Right. For something that I had a roommate named Big George and, and another one named Hillbilly. They got in a fight at a bar and it happened to turn, it was under surveillance and, they, and, a, and, a, and an undercover cop got in the middle of it. And Big George, he was about six foot ten. And uh, he he broke the guy's jaw. Big George and Hillary wound up doing five years in the state prison in Arizona. At that time, that's when I started wanting to distance myself from the club. So, so you got so you started you started um, stealing like the tractors and stuff like that. How'd you get caught for that? Well, the Higgins brothers got busted for for cocaine twice in one month. Uh, that was the, that was the story I got later on, but it came out in the discovery and they flipped Johnny to an FBI agent named Hank Webb out of El Paso, uh, FBI, um, um, special investigations, El Paso heavy equipment thefts, the head of the whole investigation, Hank Webb, an FBI agent. And they introduced Johnny to, to uh, Hank Webb under the guise. He went under the the uh, the uh, the, the uh, uh, alias Cowboy, the Rolex, the cowboy hat, the boots, the gold, right. the bling. And we started meeting this guy at a fa- at a famous restaurant in in Phoenix um, uh, called the Green Gables. So one by this time we're making we're making a lot of money. They're they're flipping, giving us thirty forty thousand a pop for each piece of equipment that we're running across the state line. We'd go to Gallup, we'd run run from Phoenix to Gallup. We'd steal one in New Mexico and run it to Las Vegas. We steal one in Las Vegas, bring it down to Phoenix. So it's like a triangle. Right. So me and Mike, and we had a kid named Mikey Liner that was hot wiring the vehicles for us, the 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 equipment. So right. we had to make sure we got out of Arizona. By the time the sun came up, we wanted to make sure we would cross the state line before the uh, the identifying the plate number and the and the serial numbers on those on the and the, and the heavy equipment and whatever it is else we we had taken, you know, came up on the, uh, the assist- NCIC. Yeah, you know, that's all they had back then. So, you know, um, the Higgins brothers gave up Johnny to the feds. In order not to go to jail for, these are pretty. These kids were half-ass tough, but either I could have whooped either one of them. All right, you know. And in fact, the guy that I beat up one night, and I, I came back a week later when the the dozen had gone in there because of all those Ohio bikers. We'd see about 50, 60 bikes from Ohio pl- with Ohio plates. So one night at a at a meeting of the dozen, my president Fat Al says we're going to go in there. Don't anybody wear any dirty dozen. 
uh, uh, paraphernalia, go in there undercover, no bikes. We're going to find out what's going on with these Ohio guys. So we went in there and I got in a fight with some guy, some big biker that, uh, and I was really young too. I was still 22, 23, clean shaven, looked awful young with the, you know, and didn't realize I was with the dirty dozen. He knew a couple of them, but he got mouthy. You know, one thing led to another and I lit him up in there and knocked all the teeth out of his mouth, put the boot to him once he, once I kicked him under the bar. But when, when I went back a week later, the, the, the owner of the bar goes, that's that guy that was here a week ago and told the Higgins brothers, throw him out. And they go, you throw him out. No. Then we, we met and we went outside and we talked and that's when we started. We got pretty friendly and they invited me to their house. You know, I started going in the club. I told the owner, listen, man, I'm alone. That what happened last week, it was just a, a fluke thing. Listen, the guy tried me and look, that's what happened. So he goes, okay. I says, I'm not coming in here with any brothers. We're not coming in here in force. So that was it. And then the, when the Higgins brothers got busted about a year later for the coke, they, you know, they turned around a year and a half later. Cause remember that during that interim, I married Chris, went yeah. back and forth, went to Miami. And so that was it. They gave up Johnny Patterson to the feds. We and, sold a bunch of heavy and, equipment to the feds. And you. No, they didn't give me up. They wanted to get me away from it. They gave up Johnny only. Johnny kind of wanted to be the uh, the spokesman. Then how did you go to prison for the heavy equipment? John would meet our our buddy, our Hank Webb, the FBI agent, cowboy at the Green Gables restaurant once a month. We would go there in a limo. Well, we would meet together. I'd drive, John would drive his Corvette. I would go over there. We're going to meet Cowboy five or six. And uh, you go in this place on a Friday or Saturday night. You got people standing. It's it's a gazillion degrees outside. You go in there. And why would notice that uh, we would be sitting at a, at a table like this. And there'd be people all around us. But four or five of the tables in the morning, one of the, you know, he, he had to have a reservation. They're not occupied. There's. And then you had some uh, uh, upraised dais where there were tables and booths, pictures on the walls. It was done in a, in a Green Gables, done in, a, in an English Tudor type of style. Right. They had a guy sitting outside on a horse in a, wearing a suit of armor in Phoenix. I used to walk by the guy, look up, I go, man, you got to be cooking. I says, man, are you alive? And, and you'd hear him mumble an obscenity under his suit of armor. I said, man, this guy's got to be, I don't know what they were paying to sit on that horse wearing that suit of armor. But anyway, we would sit down there and, and cowboy Hank Webb would walk in and we would talk and John did all the talking. Blah, 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 blah. We can bring in and we're going to bring up a dump truck uh, next week. We'll meet you in Vegas. We'll meet you. We'll go to Vegas. We'll meet you in Gallup. We're going to bring a, a, a grader on a, we're going to steal a low boy and a, and a Peterbilt or a Kenworth and bring it to Gallup. He would tell him essentially what we were going to grab and where to meet us. I never said a word. Four or five clandestine meetings with this guy. And the last meeting that we had, the uh, the Fed looks over at me and he goes, you know, Mike, I got up to leave. I was pretty roided out by then. I was cutting those big railroad locks with a set of special boat cutters, boat cutters, excuse me, to get, get to, you know, Mikey Lyon would cut a hole. We would cut a hole in the fence. He would go in there, try to get the Dobermans out, hotwire a couple of trucks, move them out of the way to get to the guy's prized tractor. And then we would... He would call me on the radio and Patterson being the chicken shit that he was, he would sit down the road about a block where he could kind of get, keep an eyeball on us, you know, eyeball the whole deal. I would tell him, yeah, I tell, tell Liner, you got to get the air pressure up to a hundred pounds. Once the air pressure was up to a hundred pounds, he would let me know and I would cut the lock, roll the gates back and he would come through. And I would shut the gates and then put another lock that matched the one that I cut. So when the contractor, his key wouldn't work in the lock, it would be a, just a... Give you another hour yeah, or so. Yeah, give me another, yeah, a little, little more, more of a window to get across the state line. So in that last meeting, I get up and I shake. I tell John, I'll see you at the club later. And I would, you know, and I looked over at the Fed, cowboy, and I said, uh, well, nice seeing you again. And he goes, you know, Mike, he tried that little cowboy, that, that hick freaking accent, yeah, he was actually from El Paso. He goes, you uh, you never say nothing, do you? I go, well, whatever. I says, uh, no, I ain't got nothing to say. I says, Patterson here, let 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 John do all. I let him do all the talking. I left. Well, he goes, I'll pick you up in the limo. He yells over, he yells over at me as I'm leaving. He goes, I'll pick you up in the limo tonight as usual. 
and we were going to a to a bar a, a club called the Store. The the biggest country western bar in the United States at the time was Gillies in Texas. Right. In in uh in uh Houston, Dallas, I forget. But the second largest was the Store in Phoenix. And that's where we would go and the, you know, millions of girls blah blah blah. And, and we, he urban, picks me up in the limo. Urban Cowboy was shot in Gillies. There you go. Yeah. You know, you know yeah. what Urban Cowboy is? No. With Travolta. With Travolta, yeah. he was. It uh, might be before Colby's time. But anyway. It was massive. Yes, it was. So, um, and I, I, would, I would go through all of that. But I didn't, I would essentially get up and I would go. After that, 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 uh, that, that thing at the store, John, it was, a, it was a deal with him. He, you know, all the girls were all over him. The blonde hair, the buck teeth. The skinny body, the Jordash jeans. So we would go, I would go there and hang out with him for an hour or two, drink, and I'd say, I gotta go. Right? So I'd have the limo take me back to order to my uh to my condo and I'd jump in my car and I wanted to go to the disco. Right. I had a lot of close friends that were in there. So, you know, I was flipping a lot of coke in there. Anyway, John getting the, that that last meeting, he says to me, he says, Man, you really embarrassed me in front of that cop. I mean, excuse me, he, you really embarrassed me in front of cowboy. You know, he really embarrassed me. I says, let me tell you something, man. I says, you dumbass, don't you think it's weird that every time we go in there on a weekend or a Friday or a Saturday that there's nobody sitting around us? What are you saying? I said, I don't know. I said, I'm just saying I got a bad feeling about it. You know, I, I, he goes, no, nah, man, everything's good. They've given us two, three hundred thousand dollars already for the, all the stuff we, we all the heavy equipment. Long, you know, long story short. Um, they waited for us in Gallup. We went to Las Vegas, took the, uh, hit Tab Construction, the largest non-union construction company in Las Vegas in Nevada, and took his prize Peterbilt and went to a job site and took a grader and took it into Gallup and they were tailing us the whole time. They, they, I would, we would, me and Liner would have the chase truck, a big dually with a snap-on tool kit. We could change a tire on a tractor. That's how much equipment we had, air compressors and everything. We would go to a motel and wait. John to get paid, and then we'd come back and grab him. And then, you know, and so we went back to about an hour or two went by, and I saw, and I said, usually he was, he was back in like 30 minutes, and I told the kid liner, he goes, I said, something's not right. I says, we're going back to Phoenix. Well, we drove back over there. The feds had grabbed John when he pulled in there when we dropped off the, uh, the you know, the heavy equipment, the the tractor, the low boy, and, and the grader. And uh, they they had grabbed Patterson from Jump Street. Webb came. They swooped, so they wouldn't have known. They didn't know where we were at. But we came back through again, and I decided to uh, stop on the interstate at, at a somewhere. Just I said I got to get something to eat. So I went to a Burger King to get two two uh, 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 you know uh, two double um, whoppers, and then we're gonna. I said we're jumping. We got enough fuel to make it to Phoenix. And Liner was dumbfounded. He was just a kid that hot wired the equipment, and he Patterson would only flip him five thousand a pop, you know. So, right. being I knew Patterson was probably skimming off the top on me, you know. But we were, you know, by that at that time, that was that was the lifestyle, and uh, you know. So when it, when we finally they they caught us, they had tailed us, and they grabbed us at the Burger King. We ended up in the in the jail in Gallup. We were taken to Albuquerque a week later, federal court arraignment. By a, we had this 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 uh, flim flam attorney named Frank Lally that wore the same jacket with the same uh, suede elbows on his on his jacket, same jacket every day that had us sign fifty thousand dollar promissory notes. So we turned around and I looked at Patterson. I says, and Patterson goes, just just. Sign the promissory note. I says, I'm not giving this guy. I says, I don't. Did you see that he's wearing the same same clothes every time he comes? He's a, he's a paid for attorney, and this guy's a bum. And and it's a small town, Gallup, and they're all telling him, you got some big shots now. You're gonna make some money off these guys, right? So we went to Albuquerque for arraignment, and uh, they had a um, highway patrolman that was essentially, you know, driving us back and forth cuff us up and take us to Albuquerque. Me and John made bond. Mom came in. Mom came to Albuquerque, sent her bondsman in from, from Miami, and we got bond. They bonded me out. Right. John put his house up and everything, and that was it. And then the, it came out on the Discovery. When we would go to that restaurant, there were telephoto lenses, 
and there were shotgun mics in the pictures in the uh, the booths that were unoccupied in the restaurant. And I told Patterson. So when it came in, out in court, the judge, Enrique Campos, a federal judge, they had nothing on me. I never said a word. Patterson did all the talking. The judge gave him five years. He wanted to be the, he wanted to play the, uh, the, the, uh, the, essentially the ringleader, but we were partners, right? But the judge loved me. And he says, um, he says, Mr. Hudson, I'm going to give you two years in, in, in anywhere you want to go. I said, he goes, I go, he goes, now you know you're pleading to misprision of a felony. Do you understand what that means? I says, Your Honor, it means that I had knowledge of a crime being committed. There was a lesser included offense from the interstate transportation. I said, uh, I said, yes, Your Honor, that means that I had knowledge of a crime being committed, but I didn't report it. He goes, exactly. I go, but Your Honor, he's, I said, if that was the case, I'd be on the phone all day long. So the whole courtroom starts laughing, blah, blah, blah. The judge starts laughing and goes, hey, I really, I really enjoy our conversations, Mr. Michael. He says, I'm going to give you two years. I says, I want to go to Stafford Federal Prison Camp. Okay, two years. You got a 90 days to clean up your affairs. You self-surrender. I said, okay. So my Aunt Carol Jean brought me up in my Cadillac, one of my cars. Right. Patterson got five. Right. He cried in front of the judge. He literally cried. So why should I get in the, and the judge hated him and, he, and, he, and, he, and the judge hated John Patterson, just hated him. He said, yeah, five years for you. You oh, yeah. just went to prison. You get out. I self-surrendered. You self-surrendered. You're there for what? A year, two years? I, was, I did 14 months total. So I wasn't uh, 17 months. You did on two years. Okay. So I did 14 months there. And they and and got a halfway house in Miami. Mom flew me in, chartered me from from the federal prison camp to Tucson, and I took American Airlines with a two hour layover in Houston, and flew into Miami to the halfway house. Mom and Doug and Aunt Carol Jean picked me up. Mom took my took my we sold the Seville, and she brought that that brand new Eldorado and parked it in the garage at the house on, in the shores. Okay. Then she, her, and they, they drove down, picked me up from the uh, airport. We went back to the house, and I had to report in by ten o'clock. And uh, um, that was it. I drove myself to the halfway house. Okay. With my Arizona, my Arizona driver's license, with Arizona tags on the on the car. So I went to the halfway house in Miami, and pulled in there at ten o'clock at night, or a little earlier. And the guy goes. Where are you from? Who are you? I go, I'm Hudson. He goes, well, you're the only American, Caucasian American in here. The rest are Cubans and Colombians. And you're upstairs in room such and such, you know, on bed number. Right. And uh, that was it. I drove myself in there. And uh, the halfway house then in, in 83 was essentially almost that we were under the old law. See? So right. um, like the federal prison camp in Stafford had no walls or no fence. You know, if you wanted to walk off that camp, you walked. I, I, there was a Mexican that was in there that got indicted, and he found out ahead of time, and he just walked all the way to Mexico. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He walked right past us. I worked at the boiler room then. I remember him grabbing one of our rakes and walking out in the middle of it, going out towards the desert. I go, hey, man, you can't pick that rake up. He just kind of smiled at me and grinned. And where are you going with a rake? And then he just threw that rake over his shoulder to make it look like he was a worker, you know, working right. with us. And, but that, there was only, I was, you know, the, uh, there was only 90, 100 men in there at any one time. How maybe, many guards? One or two? Oh, maybe, a, maybe a dozen, maybe more, but still, maybe 150 guys total, somewhere in there, but there wasn't very many. It had to be a million dollar crime or more, white collar, to get into Safford Federal Prison Camp then. The only other inmates we had in there that were not in there for a white collar crime were the Indians because they're under federal jurisdiction. Right. So we had a couple of Indians in there, the Apaches. The one killed his neighbors because he thought they put a curse on him with a with a with a hatchet. And uh, yeah, he used to. God. Yeah. So. Um. So you went back to Miami, like. How how long were you in my? I, I, you started what? Captaining a, a boat? No, for your we mom? got back to my. I'm still in the halfway house. Right. I mean, when you left the halfway house. Yeah. 
I went, I moved out to Miami Lakes and I lived with a, a pretty famous smugglers in the estates around the corner from Don Shula. I moved into his house. He had separated from his wife. So his son, uh, Wayne, I moved in there with Bobby Casal's kid and his ex-wife, Audrey, and their daughter lived there, the palatial home in the estates. And that's where I lived for a while before, you know, uh, uh, Dougie got, before we put together a load, Dougie got on a boat to go to Jamaica, and that's when he was interdicted by the Cubans. Oh, okay. By right. Castro. Right, right. And so he wound up in prison there. And, and Bobby, the uh, um, informant on my federal indictment in 2006, he, he was had, already there. He right. was already there since 79 with a kid who was the son of a, uh, of our next door neighbor. He was the younger brother of, of the individual that had gotten, um, that got overran by Hurricane David. So Bobby was doing, or was, uh, he was, he got arrested doing a, a, a load or bringing in a load for your mom, right? So he was already there once. He was already there with those guys or with the other crew members. And just one, just one. Yeah. And then Doug got caught with what? With two guys, two yeah, Cubans, two, two individuals. Yeah. Two Cubans, an old man and a, and a younger kid. Okay. And uh, the, the, the kid was an Amer an, uh, a naturalized American citizen. He was Cuban, but the old man had escaped from Cuba. Um, under Batista. He was... Yeah. Under Batista. And they, and they grabbed him when they grabbed Doug, they knew they, they, you know, interrogated everybody. And they, they put a, uh, my kid brother told me, yeah, they put a gun to the old man's head in front of the kid. So we're going to blow his brains out unless you tell us what the gringo Capitan was, uh, what's going on here because they found weapons on the boat. Right. Found an AK and, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, alley sweeper and, you know, some handguns and that was it. They, uh, they uh, essentially put a gun to the old man's head and told the kid, you're going to tell us what's going on or we're going to kill him. And, uh, he said that we were going to Jamaica to pick up a load. So they, had, I believe it or not, it could be, they 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 hit Doug with a conspiracy charge, which is essentially under a communist regime. That's kind of hard to believe that they need a a, a charge like that. Right. That know, they even need that law. Yeah. Exactly. So you know that Doug wound up in, in there, and then he walked in years later, and there's there's uh there's Young and and that kid Dana in there. A kid Dana tried to kill himself uh, uh, three times because that's how bad that prison was. They had a 15 year sentence. They didn't think uh, Bobby went, had a shootout with the Cubans when they they got high and passed out on the boat and drifted into Cuban territorial waters, and they got interdicted by the Cuban Marines. Okay. And Bobby went on deck with an M16, and they uh, yeah they shot him up, and then you know he was they were there for four years before Doug wound up almost four years before Doug showed up. So and then Jesse Jackson ran for pre right. for president a few years well, later well, and got, it, got him out. Well, wait a minute. So he was there. Your mom was bringing going in every month or so, bringing bringing food. I did a score in Miami, right? And because uh, I was essentially left alone at the time, and so when Dougie never came back with that load, we were it was just me and mom and my aunt Carol Jean, and uh, of course she had a boyfriend. The uh, you know the uh, the Italian kid Joey right. Paterno, and uh, you know so that was that basically we, and so I I uh, we only had one more boat and we didn't you know and we we had one boat we needed straps it was up on straps in other words it was in dry dock we we had no way to get it in the water so make a long story short that's I went on the street right so for uh, for about two years there I was on the street hustling you know and doing crazy stuff on the street. And a couple of scores, and I gave mom like one score for the for uh, uh, quite a bit of cocaine. Um, I uh, turned around at the King Cole over there in Normandy Island, and I uh, gave the, my mother the uh, the drugs, and she 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 uh, you know she got rid of them. And this and is the Grisalda Blanco one, right? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I, they were they were zips. That, right. that were we call the Sicilians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, but but the old man was the one that uh, the Joe Paterno, one of his soldiers named Tommy. They're the ones that that turned me on to these guys, and he just wanted to, he just wanted a piece of the action. So that's what I did. I went in there and you know and uh, 
with a went in there with a mini fourteen and a high power nine millimeter Browning and. But of course, it was what I, I would. I essentially, I any kind of a, anything like that. I try to set it up so there's. I, I really there's a ninety percent chance, hopefully, that I won't have to. Right. Discharge my weapon. And right. So I went in, you know, and I got and I got lucky. I got it, you know. Walked out with a, with a with enough cocaine to give to mom that she could continue to pay her twenty five thousand dollars a month nut that she had to come up with every month on the properties and and, and everything that we owned. And she could fly. Then she could fly to Cuba every month and feed those guys. Right, fifty pounds of freeze dried food that she could have have only fifty pounds. Because basically, you were, these guys are, would starve to death. Yeah, in that Cuban prison. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, yeah, it was pretty rough. Doug was. Uh, and they um, apparently they used Doug and and I, I guess uh, some other white guys that were in there as kind of as like jailhouse guards to watch over the other americans that were in there kind of kind of like a cool hand luke thing right remember cool hand luke they had essentially they had inmates in the movie and uh, they're also acting as like prison guards right so but doug was in there for a while you know i guess he used a baseball bat whatever with the what you know but whatever they kept him in line and uh and then jesse jackson ran for president and you know the rest is history he, he brought them all out right so you know who Jesse Jackson is, right? Sounds like a president to me. No, so <laughs> wow. So Jesse Jackson is um, Jesse Jackson was a, a a preacher. He he had actually studied under or was under um, Martin Luther King, right? Like in all the marches and stuff, he was in that whole organization. Well, at some point in the is this the seventies or eighties? Early eighties? Uh, let's see. 60s because when was Martin Luther King assassinated? No, no, I'm talking he about when he ran young. for when he ran for president. Oh, uh, seven, uh, 84. 84. So he ran for president, and one of the big problems with with he got an American down pilot out of right. uh, he got an American down pilot out of Russia. Uh, yeah, I think so. So I one of the one of the problems with him is that a lot of the candidates were saying he has no like international experience. Like this is a, a civil rights leader. Like, how's he going to run for president? So he goes on this mission and he like gets like a downed pilot, like out of Russia. Then he goes and negotiates to get, is it 22 or 23? 22 Americans. 22 Americans gets Castro to release 22 Americans that are being held in, in a Cuban prison. Two of those, one of them was, um, was, um, uh, Doug, uh, Doug Hudson, Mike's brother, and the other one was uh, um, Bobby. What's Bobby's last name? Young. Bobby Young, which is the guy that ends up is the uh, the guy on his case that worked for his mother. So they actually, he, um, so he, he flies in there on his private plane, gets ca- convinces Castro to let these guys go. They load them all up and fly them into Washington? Where they fly? They flew, uh, flew them into Dulles International in Washington, D.C. Right. And we find out about it. Uh, <clears throat> Joey was the one that come to me. Because when my, my mom and my Aunt Carol Jean had a... Uh, RV, the RV. Largest RV at the time. Uh, uh, um, uh, Fleetwood Pace Arrow. She took that she took that with a diesel. She took that motor home, and she drove it to Mexico with my aunt Carol Jean, and they and they uh, they loaded it up with pot to the gills, and drove it to Boston. And another friend of hers, a uh, famous, pretty famous gangster named Walter Abraham Metz the Third, A.K.A. Hal. Right. Hal was Hal was uh, he he was kind of like kind of like a father figure figure to me for a while there, you know, because when we were all. When Dougie was still locked up, you know, Hal and I did quite a, did some things with Hal. So, uh, Hal was in Boston, and Mom and Aunt Carol Jean took the pot up there. And then Joey came and woke me up one morning because we were living in the house, and just me and Joey in the house and in the shores, and says, Hey, the Jesse Jackson's in, in Cuba, and he's negotiating for the re- release of the, the however many Americans are there, and your brother's coming home. So I called mom and, or she called and I let her know. So Joey and I, I remember they were flying in, uh, 
when they finally, the news media finally let us know when they were coming in, I called Channel 7 News and I said, uh, it was at night. And uh, I said, this is a brother of one of the Americans that Castro or uh, released to Jesse Jackson. And, uh, you know, oh, I'd like to know when he's going to, you know, what the some of the details. And, and the lady there said, this is a night crew. There's nobody here. So was the but the but the, the the day the day crew, the reporters and blah 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 they'll be here. I said okay. She goes. I never gave her my name. Period. Anything. They must have gotten the phone number. But she turned around. And she says, "What's your brother's name?" Is a Douglas Allen Hudson. The next morning, I'm in the shower. They knock on the door with a camera crew, and Joey let them in, which really didn't go over too good with Joey's dad. Right. And uh, the lady they sent over there was there was a uh, Cecilia Fernandez, their crime investigative reporter. And Joey led them in the house. And once they walked into my mother's home, you know, jaws dropped. And I kind of steered them into the family room and sat them down. And, you know, because my mother, it was rather decadent, the uh, furnishings. And <laughs> he's my mom. Yeah. You know? So uh, the lolly crystal. And all the uh, the giant brass figurines, the shrimps, and you know, eight feet, eight foot long brass shrimp, and and the vestibule in front of the you know the windows facing the street, the the circular driveway, all kinds of. But you know, these they they were literally uh, kind of blown away by the, you know, by the uh, they kind of got a, a gist of what uh, you yeah, know. Yeah, they had to know drug uh, dealers. They yeah. knew something. They already knew she was the crime investigative reporter, and so I did an interview for. Her. Just to kind of, well, by that time, Joey let him in. So, you know, I did an interview for, which the tape, which uh, I, I got uh, years later from a, a reporter there named Sally Fitz. They all used to frequent a club in North Bay Village, which was called uh, the Runaway Bay Club. And um, I saw the her, Sally Fitz was a, was, a, was a reporter for Channel 7, and I got her to get the tape. They had taken that tape, and they gave it to CNN. So I guess it was on CNN for a couple, a couple of weeks or whatever after they came in. So who? So did your your mom and your aunt Carol Jean went and went and picked him up in the RV? They went. They left Boston and and went to Dulles International and picked up Doug, and uh, then brought him home to Miami. And Bobby was held because he Bobby was on. Was, no, Bobby was Bobby was on on federal. He had a federal warrant. He had a federal warrant. Um, or was on, uh, or, or was under indictment when they, when he, when he was on the boat, he, and uh, so they grabbed, they, they kept Bobby, but naturally, uh, the rat, you know, he somehow he worked out a deal with the feds, and probably told them, uh, you know, all kinds of crap, and and uh, they, they said, yeah, because you were locked up down there, they were, they were pretty. Uh, lenient with him because he had spent that time in prison in Cuba and, and so eventually he shows up at our door uh, a few months later but um okay so so this is the second time your brother has escaped uh, a prison sentence that probably should have killed him yeah um so at, I mean so now but at this point like you guys are are he comes back you guys start bringing in, uh, you know, larger and larger loads right now. Like now you kind of go full tilt into, um, into bringing in loads from what, from Jamaica and, and, uh, he, Columbia? uh the kid, the kid, my uh, Dougie brought in, well, uh, another load, um, in from, from, uh, his release. It was, well, it was a, a little while after his release that we, we, a load came in. He, we, we brought in a load and then, you know, he, uh, we purchased a condominium over there on the ocean and then, right. you know, and then, yeah, there was, a, and there was more, uh, you know, some more, um, uh, mischief. What? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some, yeah. Uh, once, once Bobby, once Bobby came down and, and, and him and Dougie, we, uh, Put together a few deals here and there, you know, and uh, a few, and then wound up with a problem with a guy, and then 
Uh, right. All right. So, yeah. um, so you know, so we you know, the, the, the fast forward, right? You know, past all the smuggling, the the guy turned out to be a problem, right? And it's 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 uh, public knowledge. So this guy winds up dead, right? And uh, but this guy was also talking about uh, possibly like you guys figure out that he's talk he's he's been he's been targeting he was targeting known drug dealers well this that individual you're referring to uh that's not, that's did okay. not come you got did not come come in, into the uh equation until years later when I ended up in a state prison in Florida see okay this is after me and Bobby and Dougie ran for a while and were indicted by the in the Miami uh city of Miami homicide cops were starting to try to sweat us on a, on a homicide. Right. And we, uh, yes. Is this the guy? Okay. Is this the guy that shoots at the car? Like you guys get to an argument. He shoots at the car. I set up a, I, I set up a deal for a couple of keys in the, in the, in the, in the, in the lakes. Right. And, uh, and Doug and Bobby essentially blew, blew the whole thing. They wanted to go themselves instead of me going. And, uh, and the guy, um, they brought this guy with him, but they didn't take. And he 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 essentially blew the whole the whole uh, deal and uh, almost got my brother shot. Right. Yeah. And by the individual that they were going to do the deal with, and then when they got rid of this guy, the guy that that they brought in, right, that they should have never, because mom said stay away from him. He's you know he's he's uh, he's uh, no he's no good. So you know uh, we I don't trust him. The guy turned around and. Uh, when they dropped him off at his rental car, he took a shot because he had a flat tire and they wouldn't help him, uh, you know, fix it. And he took a shot at my kid brother. So at the, as they were driving away. Right. So he took, and that was it. So they, they uh, he got, but he went to jail and that's it. He, he got out, they, they got, he got out of jail and they got him to, they, they got him over into a, a certain location in Miami and the guy wound up, they found him in Alligator Alley. Right. So that's what that's what that's what sparked the the city of Miami homicide uh, investigation. The two right, detectives, where... Nelson, Andrew, and John Spear. John Spear was the head of the city of Miami homicide. City of Miami relegated that entire investigation to them and them only. Nelson Andrew was the was the uh, the uh, city of Miami uh, cop that was the head of the investigation when Griselda Blanco killed all those killed those guys down in the in the uh, in at the Dayland Mall. At Are, Crown Liquors, that was Nelson Andrew was Cuban. He was the one that investigated that. Isn't he? Is he the detective on uh, on the documentary uh, Cocaine Cowboys? The same doc, the same detective. Those guys are rats. So I don't know about if, if Nelson was that Nelson was on a documentary about Griselda. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 okay, yeah okay. not the uh, Cocaine Cowboys. No, yeah, no. They, 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 so uh, I remember Fabio Choa coming to me many a uh, few times after I guess it was Men's Illustrated an article came out about that about that cocaine cowboy uh, movie and all that. And he goes, who is this guy, Mike, calling me Fabito? I says, I don't, to my knowledge, nobody calls you Fabito. Right. He goes, well, I don't know who is this guy. I says, he's a snitch. Uh, this John Roberts guy, he's a rat. So, you know, and the other guy that was, you know, so I says, yeah, whatever. I says, you know, and he, cause he had read the, uh, he had read the article and he didn't know. He didn't know who this guy who is. This guy all. is is telling him, you know, they're telling this this wild bullshit story about Fabio. You don't know Fabio Cho. You don't. Yeah. So right. you know, you're not. Uh, yeah. But I was. And I'd read it, and he had asked me about it when uh, when we were in in the pen in Georgia. Right. So I have a quote. What, do you remember when your brother? Doesn't your brother get? Doesn't your brother get left? In the mountains somewhere, is it? Oh, that was years before when I was still in Arizona, when I was in the federal prison camp. What happened? They flew up. This time they decided to take a DC-3 and fly it down there with the... Down where? Columbia. Okay. <laughs> and where else? And uh, and they the, 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 the house that I... When I moved into the estates, when I got out of the federal prison camp, that was Bobby Casal. He was a pretty famous smuggler in Miami in his own right. They flew, they took a plane down to Columbia, and uh, and apparently, from my my kid brother told me that 
they had a partner, a guy that lived in Arizona named Chris. Right. And uh, he was partners with Doug and Mom and Bobby on that load that they're going to fly in from Columbia. Well, the federalities didn't get their protection money. And when they landed the plane, apparently Doug went out in the jungle. And, uh, so Doug had to take a piss. So as soon as the plane landed, he goes off into the fucking jungle to take a piss. And they run up on the, uh, on the, and, and, and there were, uh, you know, Doug heard shots being fired and everything. And he stayed in that jungle. And, uh, you know, according to my kid brother, the, 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 a pilot and the co-pilot were both killed. Yeah. The federalities pull up. So they pull up. These guys landed on a, on a plane, uh, on a strip in the mountains. On an airstrip up there. And, right. Uh, to load, to, to basically load up cocaine or was it marijuana? Marijuana. Yeah. Marijuana. And it's like they didn't pay. And so they pull the pilot and the co-pilot out, you know, the plane. They're standing there. They're like, okay, you, you guys didn't pay. And they execute them. Well, Doug just happened to be taking a piss in the jungle. So he then takes, so he takes off. Oh, wait, you said that the, the people, the, the guys loading the plane took off too. You said Indians, the Indians? Those Wajitos took him up in the mountains into Colombia, and he stayed up there for three weeks, four, three or four weeks. And mom, freak, mom doesn't know what happened to him. My mother was pretty uh, stoic. Even when he, when Doug wound up in prison in Cuba, we never knew where he was at for 30 days. Right. 40 days. I'm like, I'm like uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a little worried, but mom was like stone faced. You know, she was just, and eventually he would get a, a letter from, from, from Combinado del Este in Cuba. So anyway, Doug gives one of those Indians, a runner, a note, and he runs, they, you know, it's like, uh, like the Pony Express. Right. He, he does five miles and, and then another, he gives that note to another, uh, Cu- uh, Colombian Indian and he runs five miles and they get it down to, uh, Raul in Bogota. Who gets the calls my mother and says Doug's up here in the mountains, close by where the airstrip was, you know, and we she got a plane in there to get him out. So he's up there. He loses ten pounds. He's having a ball though. He's chewing coca leaves and, uh, you know, like the Indians, you know. And he's he's up there, but he's he's got two forty fives, one under each armpit. You know, my kid brother's up there, you know, just waiting it out. And uh, like I said. That's how they. That's how they got him out. Mom flew a plane down there and got him out. Um, where the zips got? Where I robbed the zips? Yeah. Well, that was uh, that was while Doug was incarcerated in Cuba. Yeah. 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 That's okay. This, we this, we this you kind of touched on Cuba. Yeah, you yeah. kind of touched on it. But, yeah. So, um, bailout is a psychological true crime thriller that pits a narcissistic con man against an egotistical pathological liar, Marcus Shrinker. The money manager who attempted to fake his own death during the 2008 financial crisis is about to be released from prison and he's ready to talk. He's ready to tell you the story no one's heard. Shrinker sits down with true crime writer Matthew B. Cox, a fellow inmate serving time for bank fraud. Shrinker lays out the details. The disgruntled clients who persecuted him for unanticipated market losses, the affair that ruined his marriage, and the treachery of his scorned wife, the woman who framed him for securities fraud, leaving him no choice but to make a bogus distress call and plunge from his multi-million dollar private aircraft in the dead of night. The $11.1 million in life insurance, the missing $1.5 million in gold. The fact is, Shrinker wants you to think he's innocent. The problem is, Cox knows Shrinker's a pathological liar and his story's a fabrication. As Cox subtly coaxes, cajoles, and yes, cons Shrinker into revealing his deceptions, his stranger-than-fiction life of lies slowly unravels. This is the story Shrinker didn't want you to know. Bailout, The Life and Lies of Marcus Shrinker. Available now on Barnes & Noble, Etsy, and Audible. Okay. In the state prison in in North Florida. And they rob the banks and the cops come to see you? Yeah, but but what I was thinking is what got you, you you ended up doing a, a a stint in the state of Florida, and was that for the fight? No, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. When we're on the uh, when we're on the run from the homicide cops, the city of Miami, uh, oh, yeah, the homicide right. cops put the Miami Beach narcotics on me, and they went through an undercover informant and tried to set me up for five keys. Right. 
And mom knew it stunk. She didn't like the way it's. And she says, well, we got plenty of money. There's no need for you. But I like to walk around with a, with a big, you know, uh, you know, you know, back then it was just, so I wanted a little extra cash because I had to go to mom and, right. say, hey, you know, throw me 50, uh, 20, 30, whatever. And she turns around and says, no, it stinks. And I go in there anyway, and they were cops. So. Right, but you didn't, but it wasn't even, you weren't even going to sell them Coke, was it? You were, it was. Yeah, because in the, in the old days, a lot of times what, what Dougie and Bobby used to do a lot, a lot what we did was we would we'd call it, we would gaff. You get a couple pounds of sugar and gaff it, and and, and uh, you might throw an eight ball in there, and then you know right where it's at. So you throw, you know, you you. Yeah, you scoop out the the eight ball, and they if they want to test it, they te- they can make, test it. Yeah, make sure they're not. Yeah, this way, this way, so we're ninety nine percent of it's sugar, but you've got you know the, the spot where the ape where the where the coke is. So they they scoop it up and you test gaff it. it. So this way, if anything uh, anything crazy goes down, you'll know they're not cops. You might and you might say, "Hold on, don't freak out," but just wanted to make sure you guys were, uh, you know, who right. you say you are. Naturally, the cops come in there and hold themselves out to be drug dealers, right? And they're not. So you so did that to this guy when and when he pulled out a syringe to test it. That's when I the alarm bell went off. So I just put my pistol in uh, right up under his jaw, and he had a heart attack. They thought it was going to be a slam dunk, but I scared him to death. So that was it, and then. Uh, I pretty much robbed them for the cash. Right. So, and, but, you know, they. Uh, but it didn't work out. Well, of course. Yeah. You want, uh, so I wound up and uh, I indicted for possession of cocaine. Uh, they, they, they threw it out there as a kilo because we were going to do a kilo up front first. But what I wanted, to, uh, you know, I wanted to count all the money for the five keys, but they were hedging on that. They didn't have. They couldn't get. They couldn't get City of Miami Beach to give them that much money to bring to me to count. So we came in. We said, "Well, I said, well, we'll do two then." See, so let's you know. And then then they then they uh, they uh, essentially got me down to to, you know, to the kilo. And I said, "Okay," you know. And so uh, that was it. They brought the cash for a key, and it was you know almost thirty G's. So that was it. So I you know. Um, Janet Reno prosecuted me on that case, personally. So how, how much time she you Well, we were already on the homicide investigation. The city of Miami homicide came into that that uh, house where uh, that individual essentially was, uh, we, we killed him. What they did was they came in looking for forensic pathology, blood, brain matter, blah, 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 and they found a large cache of weapons, some real exotic stuff, and it took... Uh, you know, my kid brother and me a years to, to collect. Mostly my kid brother. So they got my prints on a sawed-off shotgun. Right. And that was it. They were able to get a warrant out for my arrest for the two sawed-offs. They found me in Tampa at a safe house while they were, while Doug and Bobby had jumped jumped Florida and had gone to Tennessee to another safe house while we are being investigated and followed all over uh, South Florida by these two homicide cops. And their crew. So, to make a long story short, they got me in Tampa, here in Tampa, and I went to the Hillsborough. They found me in the safe house, the Hillsborough County Jail. Mom bonded me out, and I met a met a, a young hooker up here, and I took her back to the condo we had on the ocean in Miami, and then you know hung out there for a while, and just kind of she said, "Cool your heels for God's sake." And I had an attorney, uh, Mark Krasno, that represented me in that case. And then they tried to set me up for the uh, for the for the narcotics, and then you know, of course, the, and then they so those two charges, they lumped them together and ran them concurrent. It was it was attempted murder on a police officer, possession of a kilo, trafficking, possession of trafficking in cocaine, possession of you know you know how it is. Yeah, yeah. They, they, a little shotgun. See, I hope one of the pellets will stick. See, so make a long story short. We, uh, that's about the time that, uh, you know, I, I started going, my attorney was Jewish and that's when I, uh, you know, started to, I want, and I couldn't get a, I was on bond on the shotguns. I made bond in Hillsborough County jail. So I was on bond when I flew back to Miami with the, with that, with that girl and then kind of, you know, kind of laying low, but you know, and everything, you know, with Doug and Bobby being out of state now where well, there's a lot of heat. You see, 
Plus, we're with she, my mom's still with the uh, with Joey, the uh, the Gambino uh, uh, captain's freaking uh, kid. So you know, so we got a lot of heat. So calm down, try to take it easy, don't do anything crazy. But you know, I was a little uh, unbalanced at the time, you know. So I went went for the for the uh, the, the the street drug buy, and they were cops. Right. So, so they, they they ran them concurrent the shotguns with the other charges. They ran them concurrent, and about that time, I started going down to the uh, to the chapel, and started you know going down there with a, a guy named uh, Willie who was a Cuban. He got busted for two kilos, so he took me down the chapel and I uh, went down there and start. I heard the gospel and I got saved. Simple, and then wound up. Uh, then my attorneys, then Janarino's trying to give me forty years, and every month they come with a little bit lesser of a, of an offer, forty. 35, 28, and I'm flipping out, and they're thinking, you know, this, and, 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 and my attorney's going to attempt a murder on a police officer. The cop's going to testify. You, uh, you know, you put a, a loaded pistol up under his, in his neck, put it in his belly or whatever, you know. So their little slam dunk investigation didn't quite go the way they had planned it. So they had a little vendetta, and these guys, look, they tried to steal my Rolex when I, when they had me cuffed and all this kind of stuff. So to make a long story short, the attorney comes to me and he goes, uh, uh, we, we're Jewish. We don't believe in Jesus, but something's going on here. She kept coming down, you know, because he he um, initiated an entrapment defense. And back then, here you got these cops holding themselves out to be under to be drug dealers or undercover narcotics agents. And so what he did was he, he raised that entrapment defense and Reno still trying to step, step to us with, with an offer that was just, uh, for me, it was just, you know, 20 years. He got down to around 20. She takes a vacation, tells her subordinate, Sally Weintraub, offer him, uh, don't offer him less than 12. They'll think they've got no, they'll think we've got no case. Well, Weintraub did. Well, she came to me with five and a half years. Right. Now, I'd already got a year in the county jail. They, 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 and they dropped some of the charges, and I had to plead to the bin man for the pistol. So I, had to, I told my attorney, I got a year in a county jail. I do two more years for the, for the min man for the pistol. After that, the back of the sentence, I says, they're telling me they're giving everybody in the state of Florida 120 to 150 days consecutive gain time. Every month, because of the overcrowding, and that and that, and that judge that had signed that that uh, you know that that uh, order for to to uh, start releasing inmates. Right. So I said, he goes, no, we we got this case beat five and a half years. They don't have a case. I said, no. You never know. I said, no, that's not that's uh, that's not that's not what God's telling me, man. I said, I tell you right now, that's not what I'm hearing I, from the Lord. I'm telling you right now, I'm taking the deal. I told your mom. That uh, you're going to be home in two weeks. We're going to trial. Well, a famous gangster from from uh, Canada, also another friend of of, of Joe Paterno's, named Willie O'Brien, also known as the Meat Packer. He was a Jewish mobster and a heavyweight. He loved me, and they we were all locked up in there together at that time. Joe got arrested on a murder uh, indictment. Then they got Obi O'Brien Willie. They got they got Obi. And they got one of a couple of Joe's uh, um, soldiers, so we're all locked up in there together. And then Obi went to the Jewish attorney and says, "Give Marlene back most of that money you gave her. Mike's going to plead out. So the most of that money she gave you, you give it back to her." But he had initially told this a Jewish attorney from Jump Street months before, "Make sure you do a good job with Michael, or otherwise I'll." All right. So he's coming to me. When he comes to visit me in, in the Dade County Jail, he's all hyped up and really just a, a real um, uh, uh, gun shy and skittish. And I asked my mom, "What's going on?" And that's when she when she came to visit me. She says, uh, "Will Obi told him if he doesn't uh, do a good job, he's going to kill him." So <laughs> I said, "What are you doing that for?" You know, because at the time I didn't really uh, realize. You know what the you know the way things would end up and the way things would pan out. So I took the deal, and uh, I did the two I did two more years on the on the pistol, 
and then I was I was out in another. When I when I started, I, you can't you couldn't get the game time while you were doing the min man, right? Right. And after that, the two and a half years in the back of the sentence, it was gone. So and and when I and when I when I pled. The judge, Ralph Persons, was apparently, and you and I both know that this is a real rarity. He was a he was a preacher, as well as a, as a, as a Day County judge, so he is always ragging those homicide cops. Don't come in here and disparage that defendant, and tell them about how many tell me about tell this court about how many people they killed. And this stick to the issues, you know, and uh, or I'll I'll, I'll 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 charge you with the contempt, and then uh, you know once I took the deal. Reno, she came back from vacation, found out what Weintraub Wine had done, but I had signed the deal. Right. It was over with. And she could hear her screaming in his chambers. They had a sidebar. And they went into the judge's chambers. She was screaming at Weintraub, do you realize what you've done? You know, we can't get the mother, but, you know, we, we had this guy. We had the son, but I was home in 89. I was back home in 89, four years. Well, when you, So when you were locked up, though, some detective or was it FBI FBI came to see you right because Dougie and Bob, when I was when I was locked up in Baker Correctional Doug and Bobby had split up when they were in Tennessee so they got me first right right then Doug was still on the lam he hooked up with this one of the individuals that was also an informant and in, in, in the uh, federal indictment for the for the cocaine the jumper the smuggling yeah that was his yeah, this individual there were two brothers. Yeah. The, oh, this was the older brother. They they killed him in a federal prison in the Midwest somewhere. Apparently he was uh I don't know, yeah. C- the, Claker. Claker. Yeah, they found they they hung him in his cell. He was a rat. So uh like the like the kid brother, they're you know, they're they're informants. Right. So to make a long story short, Dougie hooked up with the older brother, the whatever they nicknamed the jumper, because he'd escaped from a few jails, and they robbed a few banks in Jacksonville. Right. Well, I and thought it was because he was jumping over the. Uh, he would run and jump over the. I guess because yeah. I never knew the guy. Right. I have. I have. I read the articles. Like I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Getting yeah. the articles. I never knew the guy. I just. I was already. I was already locked up by then. Sentenced and up in Baker Correctional. So uh, they took Doug and put him in prison and, and and on that shootout in New Orleans. Right. So so Doug got shot they, up in New Orleans over that when they were on the run. Right. So they. He and he and Claker decide to start robbing banks. They start robbing banks. Then they end up. It, it gets hot, and the banks are being watched, and they're concerned. So they they, they got drive fifty thousand in cash, and they go to New Orleans. New Orleans, right? And then Doug was told to get to fly to Jamaica to stay with a big grower that we knew there. Right. Uh, a Jamaican uh, had his own. You know, he was a boss, and Doug. We were real close with him, and Doug was going to fly there. Chinny, Chinpo. Right. And, uh, you know, Chinese. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that very night they went out and got and got drunk and called a cab and Claker got into an argument with the cab driver and the cab driver took off and Claker cranked off around at him like an idiot. And uh, there were two undercover New Orleans detectives across the street having a drink. And they got in a shootout. Claker laid right down. He's no killer, right? You know, see, and Dougie, Dougie had two forty fives, and they exchanged uh, um, uh, gunfire, and then and they 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 hit Doug, and then Doug took off down an alley, and they hit him a few more times, and then, you know, this that is was it. This Doug. is a shootout on Bourbon Street. On Bourbon Street. On Bourbon Street in New Orleans, he gets into a shootout with two fucking two cops. And they track him down in an alley. And they shot him a bunch of times, right? Six or seven rounds. My kid brothers got in and out, but he had a few operations. He had quite. A, he had two or three. And then when I called home one night from the Dade County Jail, my mom goes, "You better sit down. I got some bad news. Your brother got in a shootout in New Orleans." And I'm screaming, "Why in the hell didn't he go to New Orleans like I told him? Or why didn't right. he fly out of New Orleans to Jamaica?" But you can thank the you can thank that that screwball that he was with. Say, see, so Doug would have, Doug would have, uh, it might have blown over, see, because that's what happened on on that on that homicide. It's it's common public knowledge, the Panzerbecki murder. That's what happened. They it blew over. They were never able to indict. Right. They well, never they never indicted any. They, yeah, they had the the city of Miami cops went nowhere with that investigation. Well, the FBI showed up to to talk to you about years, Doug. Right? Years later, 
on right. the, under the in 2006 and seven in FDC in Miami about the Van Zavecchia murder and some other murders. No, no, I meant I meant you were locked up and they came and showed they came you the to pictures me of... about the bur- the bank robberies. Right, right, right. So they they called me off the compound and I went in there and there's two FBI agents and they sit they sit me down. I go, what's this about? They go, oh, your brother here. They show me. Uh, Glossy uh, black and white photographs of Doug standing there with an Uzi. I said, "We're drug smugglers, man. We 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 don't you know we're not we don't rob banks." And he slides the whole photo over to me, and it's Doug. And I went, uh. and he goes, "Well, I said, what do you want me to tell you? I got nothing to, to, to tell you. Well, we want to know about this." And they got us started going off on tangents about some murders and some other stuff, and you know, and Bobby. And I said, "I, I can't tell you nothing." All right. So. That during my tenure in 89, while well, I was it'd be just before 87, just before I got out, that's when the whole Miami Herald, the whole uh, uh, um, uh, one section in uh, the Miami Herald was about Don Arano being killed. Right. And that's when I, uh, I remember reading that article because we'd get a Miami Herald like a night before it would, you know, they would fly a Herald up there. So we would get it the exact day that the paper came out. And I'm reading it and, uh, Small, still voice in my ear because it says uh, Don Arano pulled over by a late model Lincoln, dark blue, black Lincoln Continental or a, or a town car. Shots ring out. The car makes you turn around Don Arano and his Mercedes and it takes off. Well, who is Don Arano's first? Most people don't know. Well, he was the he was the uh, the the innovator of the uh, the go fast boat industry. Right. Essentially. So, so basically the. The DEA had been formed because there were so many, so much drugs coming into Miami at this time. And they're bringing in, they're using boats that they, that they fucking, they, they can't catch. They couldn't catch the midnight expresses. Right. And some of the cigarettes, which were modified, they, they, they couldn't catch them. So they went to Don Arano. That's when Papa Bush had come down there and Don Arano built those tunnel holes, those, 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 uh, cats for, for the federal government. So when you say the blue thunders, right. When you say Papa Bush, you mean, the be- dad. Right, right. So yeah. so Bush, Bush who was the uh, head of the CIA. CIA at the time. They were, they were all in every, they were in the middle of everything. Right. I mean, listen, we all know, we know everything about him. Right. So, so look, he came down there, ni- nice little nice little PR stunt. Don Arano's going to build uh, uh boats to interdict the uh the go fast cigarettes coming out of uh, the Bahamas. Right. That was Willie Fall- Willie and Sal. At that time they were they were running, they were starting to run. They were running hard. So you know these, and I was I was locked up with Sal with Willie's brother uh, uh, Gus, so the Falcone, so uh, and Sal Magluta. But anyway, uh, the make a long story short, yeah, the, the Arano built Arano. No one knew at the time that uh, Arano was had been either had been flipped, but essentially when he was killed, when I was up there in Baker, we thought it was you know. We found out years later. Well, they got Bobby. I had gotten out in 89. They didn't grab Bobby until uh, 90, 80, 90, I think. And then they grabbed Bobby for bragging to some. He was under an alias in a, in a prison in, in uh, um, the upper Midwest in Oklahoma and uh, telling everybody that he was a, uh, coke, uh, a, 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 a smuggler and a hitman from Miami running his running his mouth and ended up uh, one of the jailhouse informants went to the sheriff there and says, hey, there's a guy in here that says he's some kind of famous uh, hit man. And, and, the, and the sheriff says, boy, there ain't nobody like that up here. Go on back to your cell. Well, he kept coming back to the sheriff telling him the same story. So they sent the prince down to Miami. And the city of Miami homicide says, do you know who you got there? That's Robert Samuel Young. And they went up. He knows too much about this murder. They went up and grabbed him. And well, once they grabbed him, he gave it all up. Right. Well, let's go back for a second. So, so Don Arnos is building these boats, but why was he killed? Like, I, I know you you just ran through it real quick for me, but anybody watching this doesn't know half of what you, you see. We th- every, we and even at that time, um, when when I was already I was living with mom in another property that we owned. And he called from the county jail. She goes, it's Bobby. So I got on the phone with him. And I said, whoa, whoa, man, long time, bro. He goes, he goes, uh, yeah, I'm, they got me down here in the Dade County Jail. They come up and grab me. I was under an alias up in Oklahoma. 
they indicted me on the Don Arano murder. I go, you mean the one back in 87? Or, uh, you know, I think it was 1987. And uh, I go, I said, I said, don't talk on the phone. You know, it's okay. It's good. I got a, uh, he had some kind of a, back back then they could use, they could make a call. It it wasn't like a cell phone. It was uh, like a, a transponder that would do the numbers. Okay. Yeah, something like the the beeps on the uh, so he had some way to get out on the phone and then go to we had us go two way with his with his attorney uh, Don Grant up in Fort Lauderdale. And Freddie Haddad was also his attorney. Right. So, Bobby starts running telling me about the they brought Benny down. They brought Ben down from Leavenworth and uh you know, I'm going to take it to the they they're going to charge me with a hit. Because when you back up when I read that article years before, a still small voice had, had almost like whispered in my ear. Uh, the Holy Ghost whispered in my ear, Bobby did it. As, hey, I'm telling you right now. And when I read the article, you know, I, I'm reading the article and I'm thinking, just, just for some reason, I get this thought, late model Lincoln Continental or whatever, you know, pulled up next to Don Arano, flagged him down his Mercedes. And got it right, got real close to him. I mean, as close as you and I are. See, that's how that's how Bobby worked. You know, he was uh, he was not a uh, a pistolero like me and my kid brother. My mom could skip a tin can in midair with a thirty eight. See, we we're all rednecks raised out out in Arizona, Texas. So anyway, uh, I just had that feel that that thought. You know, just that this all of a sudden the bo- it came into my head, Bobby. Why I, I just never 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 really thought about it. Uh, after that much until years later I'm home and and uh you know mom says Bobby's on the phone then he starts telling me they indicted him on the murder and then it all I flash flashback and I said holy smoke and I just started you know I thought about that that thought that I'd had years before so he's telling me they're going to take him they're going to give him the chair they're going to do this do that little did I know that the state of Florida flipped him and he flipped on Ben Kramer right. who they whom they whom they brought down Okay, but the bottom line is Ben Kramer, uh, uh, contrary to public knowledge, Ben Kramer never was not a killer. He had nothing to do with the Don Arano murder. Right, but Ben Kramer was a huge importer or smuggler of yes. of he was, marijuana, Benny. and he was looking. He had already gotten like what, like a life sentence? Yeah, life sentence. Right. Yeah. So Bobby blamed the said that that uh, that Ben Kramer had hired him to to uh to kill Aranos, but that's not the case it's not the case right and uh, uh i had i had discovery in under the federal indictment um that you know that bobby uh essentially had told he told he he hoodwinked the state of florida and he also hoodwinked the feds and the feds ran with it and it was all bullshit see he ran with that narrative that ben kramer had hired bobby to kill him so, but why did Bobby kill him? Uh, an individual whom I won't name was approached by the Colombians, who is extremely, extremely close to me, whom I love very much, had finally let me know uh, a while back, this and this is what really went down. They came to me and they says, your friend tried to rip us off for a couple hundred keys. Right. We found out he was lying to us. Now, we're going to kill him. You mean Aaron O's? Bobby Young. Bobby Young, okay. We're going to kill him. Here's the deal. Some of our boats are getting in, interdicted on, on, the, uh, on the high seas coming in, coming in from, uh, from, from the Bahamas. Uh, this guy that we want him to kill, has been, uh, he's the boat builder, and he's glassing in transponders into the boats. And So the Coast Guard can grab him. Yes. So... Um, there you there you have it. Uh, they said, "Here's the deal: we're going to wash the 200 keys. We're going to give him a quarter of a million, not the sixty thousand that that uh, uh, allegedly Benny had given Bobby to kill Arano. We're going to give him a quarter million. We're going to wash the 200 keys, and he's going to kill Arano. Otherwise, we're going to kill your friend. And my and this individual that I'm that I'm referring to was was incarcerated at the time." So he had to reach out and uh, to Bobby and say, "This is what you got to do, right? Otherwise, you're dead." And uh, 
you know. And then Bobby waited on Aranos and killed him. He killed Arano. Yeah. Otherwise, the Colombians were going to kill him. So, well, and, the, and, and this is this is public knowledge. The thing that you know, like you and I both know, the thing that irks me is that the state of Florida and the, and the feds ran with that with that baloney and uh, put it out there as uh, as uh, you know as gospel, and like it was etched in stone. And, well, and there's that the book uh, uh, Speed Kills, and then they turned that into a movie with uh, John Travolta. Yeah. Right, which was all uh, they they brought in some actor to, and 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 Arano had nothing to do with Meyer Lansky. Yeah, or yeah, any, yeah. Any of, the, any of that uh, any of that 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 that, that crap well, that they were Hollywood. trying to run by the general public. That's Hollywood. And, yeah. So uh, <laughs> fake ass. So anyway, uh, bottom line, there you go, and that's that's the that's that's the Arano murder, and you know, and and uh, Bobby. Uh, was never hired by then. Well, Bobby goes to Bobby goes to prison, and at this point, your 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 mom's not doing well, right? Like your mom passes away. She's uh, yeah, in eighty four, she died uh, the emphysema. So how old was she? Fifty six. Fifty six. Um, man, that's young to die. Yeah, you know we are we were very close with Sam the plumber, to Cavalcante. That's the that's the he's the uh, mafioso. He had his own crew. That they modeled the Sopranos after, and Sam and I were having dinner just alone one night, and I says, uh, "How is it you got? You know, he was in his seventies. You're smoking. He was sitting there at the at a steakhouse in uh, we were uh, off Biscayne Boulevard, and we he says, come on, come on, Mikey, let's go have dinner.' So I'm over there, we're talking. I says, "How is it you're smoking?" And Mom, you know, I said, "And you got emphysema." He goes, "Your mother's got the worst kind." He says, "She's got the, uh, you know." She's got the real bad uh, emphysema, not mine. I, you know, I can still, I still smoke and stuff like that. So there were several different types of emphysema that mom just had. My grandfather died of it. He was a, he was a copper miner in Arizona. He died of it. So the Mayo Clinic had told mom, she spent a lot of money too with the Mayo Clinic. Right. Going back and forth up there. They had told her that it was hereditary. So. Well, so she, so she passes away. And Bobby gets out of prison, but by but you're not doing anything at this point. You're you're you well, you've, when I got, you've completely. When I got out in '89, I was I I got a job. At, uh, you know, when I when I came home, mom goes, "It's not like the old days. You got to get. You're gonna have to get a job." Right. And I looked at her. I said, "What? You mean like working?" She goes, <laughs> "Pretty much." So I go, "Okay." So, uh, uh, um, I got a little a little uh. uh uh, uh, apartment on the on the ocean and turned around and and for the time being I got a job bouncing at a, a nightclub pretty famous nightclub in North Miami Beach called the Sod right and uh, I went to work you know tuxedo but it was it was pretty crazy you know working there okay okay so as a bouncer right well okay when I when we we're locked up and I don't know where it is in the in the story but I want to mention this one story um I almost really want to mention it for Colby's benefit. Um, so you, so I'm writing this story. I'm going to tell you, I'm writing this story, right? And I'm sure I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll fuck it up, but I'm writing this story. And Mike's telling me about how he's being trained by, who was the boxer that was training you? When I came home in 83, um, in the federal prison camp, you know, we were, I still had a lot of the, the steroids, the residual uh, steroids in my system. So I went in there, and there's a guy, you know, I had to sell surrender. So for the 90 days that Judge Campos gave me to clean up my affairs, before my aunt dropped me off in, the, uh, the, in Safford, uh, Arizona, you know, I pretty much partied for 90 days. I just stopped going to the, my, my, the individual that owned Gold's Gym. No, no, this was in Miami. I'm talking about the time you're parking your your Jaguar and these oh, guys okay. drive by. Who was that? Who was? You, you, yeah. Sorry, that was there was a some you were training with some boxer or something. What was it? Uh, let's back up. I came home in '83 from the federal prison camp. Right. Dougie right. got on the boat. Castro grabs him, and I, I, uh, um, am introduced to Tony Aiello, who was a a, a lightweight champion or uh, Golden Gloves, undefeated. 
and he lived in North Bay Village, and we became through another individual that uh, was a, a hairdresser. Anthony was a hairdresser. Right. He also fought. He was Italian from New Jersey, and uh, we became very close. And I met a lot of great fighters through him. I mean, national and golden gloves champions. And we are all a little tight knit group that lived, you know, we, uh, eventually my mom, I wasn't living at home too much anymore. Me and Anthony were training every week, every right. day. Sometimes we were running five miles in 30 minutes. So Anthony takes me under his wing and he starts to train me. Right. So and I already knew how to fight, right. but he really honed my skills. So, so Mike's parking his, his Jaguar one day. And this fucking uh, like a, a four by four with a like three guys in it a drive by. Truck. It was a dump truck. It was a dump truck. I thought it was a pickup um, truck. This came Boulevard at a, at a at a mall right there across the Keystone Point Marina, and it was it was called. There was a Kenny Rogers had come out with a rotisserie chicken. He was the first one called called. Uh, I don't think they have cluckers. Them they were good though. Yeah. Yeah, I got I got the worst food poisoning in my entire life twice from Kenny Rogers. Really? They were I thought oh, they yeah. were great. I thought they were great. Yeah, yeah. So uh um I would have liked to grab Kenny Rogers by his beard and shake him a little bit. But anyway, I almost died on the second about a food poisoning I got from that chicken. So there was another one that came out called Cluckers. And it was there and I had a good close friend of mine named Ross that had gotten busted cold in Boston with 80 keys. When I was, he was a valet parker. When I got out of the federal prison, the, the prison camp in 83, and he used to watch me and mom and Doug pull up to the valet at the place for steak. And he really got, and got close to us. Cause after, after hours, we would go to a lot, there were a lot of gyp joints up and down that, up and down that, uh, he called it Gangster Row on, on uh, 79th street right there. Uh, going from Biscayne Boulevard over two bridges and into Normandy Island. That little area right there on the Kennedy Causeway had a bunch of real fancy uh, uh, nightclubs and restaurants. And uh, Ricky Cavero and a lot of those guys, his guys, they, they all frequented that whole area for years. So, you know, that's where I met Ross. So Ross, when I got locked up, Ross went went to, uh, uh, got, you know, uh, be became partners with some Colombians and uh, they owned a restaurant in Normandy Island and Ross got bus for 80 keys. So fast forward, Ross calls me up and says, let's have lunch. After I got out in 89, that's when I was a, still a bouncer at, at Facade, I got out in 89. He goes, meet me over here at, uh, at uh, it's, it was the Piccadilly. Right. It was, and but next door to Cluckers. So I, I said, okay. So I drove over there and I'm back in the Jag in because I, it was a European 12 cylinder and it was really, you know, uh, the air dam was so low, you couldn't get a pack of cigarettes under the air dam. So I always backed it in. And these guys came whipping around the corner in a dump truck and, you know, got a little close to me going too fast in that parking area. And I kind of put my hand out and one of them, one of them uh, flipped me, uh, gave me the gesture with his middle finger. So, Ross was come walking up. I backed the car and they parked down, you know, six or seven cars down or further where they could get that dump truck. And they came walking up, three of them. And uh, I'd been partying the night before, a little hungover. And I and I stepped to him. I said, hey, man, what's up with the, uh, you know, who you flipping a bird at? Right. And the guy goes, hey, uh, listen, man, uh, blah, blah, blah. One thing led to another. And they kind of surrounded me. And. Words were exchanged. Ross came up. Ross is no fighter, but he was about six foot six, right? And he's standing there, practically an albino. And that's and and then uh, one thing led to another, and I figured they were all going to try. You got three of them, and there's just one of me. So I knocked out Shorty on my right, and then the other two tried to jump me, and I banged them up. One pulled a knife. I took it away from him, banged him up a little bit. And Ross, in the meantime, just running around, you know, he's just yeasting up the whole situation. And the one, I knocked out another individual. And then the third one, he ran into the Piccadilly and I chased him in there. I just, you know, by this time, I'm, I'm a little incensed. Right. And then by that time, I ran in there, I caught him in there and I knocked him out in front of about, I, I, I knocked one of his teeth into a bowl of lentil soup where there was a, there was six or seven Jewish uh, uh, yentils sitting at a table and uh, they're they're screaming oy vey and the general manager of the of the restaurants you know they they watched the whole the place was packed 
but there's an undercover North Miami detective there. But he didn't do a thing. He just came out. He didn't get involved at all. So I walked. Ross ran in and says, Mike, I heard sirens. So I headed back out towards the car. And I says, I'm out of here. And Ross says, I'm on a million-dollar bond. Please, Mike, I'll talk to the cops. And bro, and they, Ross taught me into two $20,000 bonds. So when they, they, they took me to jail, uh, two counts of aggravated battery. And when I got down there, I called mom. She came and got the car. And then she says, the bondsman's coming down there. Give him the watch. So I, so I flipped him the president, the role. I flipped him the Rolex, and then he just bonded me out. And it's all right. So he tells me this story, right? That was a longer version, but exactly the the, the story that I, uh, you know, that the part that got me was three guys come up to you on the fucking street, on the sidewalk, in the parking you, lot. You smash three guys, chase one of them into the Piccadilly. Uh, that's when he pulled the knife on you. Took the knife away from outside him. Outside the parking lot, he pulled the knife. Oh, okay. I think in the yeah. book I wrote that he he had pulled the knife inside. But anyway, he takes the knife away from him, smashes him in the face, right? The cops arrest him, take him away. And I remember when I heard the story, not that this is the most ridiculous story. Like out of all of them, there's tons of stories that are just like, that's just insane. That couldn't have happened. But I read this. I mean, like I, I'm sitting there and I'm like, did he just say he beat up three guys on the fucking that came up to him and I thought, man, that's, that's, you know, this is, it's come on, stop it, bro. Like, stop. This is a, it's like a Clint Eastwood movie, an old, not the old, not old man Clint Eastwood when he was young, when he was in his thirties doing these things. Like, and I thought that there's no way that, but I ordered the freedom of information act. And as soon as I had written that and I was right, still writing the story within a week, I get the freedom of information act. And there's the report on the three guys <coughs> that approach him that he gets into a fight with and there's a attached to it is a transcript of a, a a hearing where there where it's your lawyer is is deposing one of the guys well he did depositions on all of them okay well i will remember reading the one where the guy the guy because i remember what the guy My says attorney says to him he says uh, billy thomas in fact, you know who gave me Billy Thomas? Bobby. When Bobby was still in Dade County Jail under the uh, Arano indictment. Okay. He says, get with this guy here, this Billy Thomas. I said, okay. And then, uh, not to get off on a tangent. So so Billy qu quotes me his fee. And I think it's like five Gs. And he already knew. He had a good, an idea. So uh, he wasn't, it wasn't more. My good brother... For 20 years, and, and one of my, my, my brother, my best friend, Nick Catrone, who was the son of Vic Catrone from the Catrone crime family in Montreal. Okay. And his uncle Frank took over the business. And you see a lot of this on a lot of these documentaries. The, uh, the Sicilians that came in, the Catrone, the Catrone crime family, and me and Nikki. Nikki was introduced to me when I came home from the federal prison camp in 83. Nikki takes me to see Jeff Weiner, who was a big drug attorney. And Jeff wanted 20 G's. So I says, okay. And, you know, so I went back to Billy Thomas and told him, yeah, you, I went to see Nikki took me just to get a, a, an, another opinion and 20 G's. So Billy Thomas jacked up his fee. But to make a long story short, so Billy had taken depositions from all of these guys. And they go, they thought they had somehow misconstrued that Ross, six foot six albino, was me. Or they said the guy. So their 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 descriptions of the of the defendant were uh, erroneous. Number two, um, he admits to my attorney. He admits to Billy. But Billy goes, "You pulled a knife on my client," and uh, the, he goes, "Yeah, he clocked me. He he clocked the the one kid first, and then he goes, there's three of you and one of him, and you pull it.' And so he says, "Yeah, he he, he snatched my knife right out of my hand, and he then he then he knocked my teeth out." Yeah, that's that's how. So I read the whole transcript, and it is. There's three of them. They approach him. There's a fight. He hits the one guy. One guy runs away. Another guy runs away. Mike chases him into the Piccadilly. And then I'm reading the whole thing. And I remember reading the whole thing. I'm like, okay, so that did happen. Like, this is obviously this happened. And in the very end, I'm like, it doesn't say anything about his teeth getting knocked out. And then the very last thing is his lawyer says, do you regret approaching Mr. Hudson? And he goes, he goes, of course I do. I'd still have my two front teeth if I, if I hadn't approached him. And I was like, oh, my. 
God, his front teeth did get knocked out. But it was like the last what, sentence. One of them landed in a bowl. It's kind of when I hit him with the last shot and knocked him out. The Oh, the one guy that was still, there was two knocked out in the parking lot. One of them got up, the bigger one, and he ran in and jumped on my back when I was, when I when I had already stepped to the other guy, uh, the guy that ran in. And I pulled him over my back like a little superhuman, it's adrenaline. I drug him over my back and knocked him out again. And then the other guy was hanging on, there's a there's a chrome rail that runs through there. You go through a turnstile. It's a, it's a, it's like a smorgasbord. You get a ticket. Right. And, but it's high end. Uh, uh, you know, Piccadilly. And I remember hitting him with that last shot and something in my peripheral vision, you know, uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a, an elliptical path. And I, and I kind of, in my peripheral vision, I, it's like a plop noise, plop. And it's his tooth. It went right into a Jewish lady. She had her hair up up high in, in, a, in a high pyramid with a bunch of gold pins in it. And um, she screams, oy they. And the rest of them scream, right? Or, or, uh, rest of the Jewish ladies scream, oy they. And so about that time, I hear the Ross runs in. Ross is standing behind me. He would yeast, he was yeasting the whole thing up. And then, uh, but Ross couldn't fight a lick. So he goes, I hear the sirens. And I know when I was an outlaw biker, that was the, the, the many fights. I, I got to my, got to my Harley and got to my hog, my, my chopper and cranked it over, no lights and took off every time. Well, guess what? This time I'm heading. It's a, you know I'm heading towards the jag, and Ross is behind me crying about his million dollar bond. I'll talk. I'll talk to the cops, and when and I he actually got cut with that knife, so I'm showing the cop the knife, and or the cops got the knife, and I'm going with the right hands. That can just that that can sever your juggler, your right. carotid. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, yeah, but they're pretty messed up bad. Because I'm sorry, but well, I'm gonna have to charge you with aggravated battery. So there you go. Then the cop I saw him when I became a roofing contractor, I saw him years later, did a lot of North Miami uh, police officers, a few of them, the roofs. He's telling me, I, well, I'd see him at a bar. He, I feel real bad about arresting you. Well, it's a little late now. <laughs> so you know, listen, so, so yeah. you, come, you come back, you've got, you, your mom says you got to get a job. You end up becoming a roofing contractor, right? Well, in order, the state of Florida tried to give me seven years. For the aggravator battery. Okay. Mom's going, you're getting this, you're going to prison. Now this time she's pretty sick. We sold the house in the ocean. Now we're over here at another property. You're going to prison for seven years for a fight? I go, Mom, they're looking at my prior my prior you know, yeah, 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 yeah. And and I've only been out. So that, that's what that's what, essentially what they're the state of Florida is trying to run. The, uh, the prosecutor's name was Garcia. And uh, Billy kept putting it off. He kept getting the continuous, getting the continuous. And in the meantime, I'm, uh, you know, pretty much just uh, on the street. I'm on bond. So, you know, I'm waiting for, uh, you know, things to, to pan out. We're going to see what's, what, what's going to happen. And, and Bobby's calling all the time. What's going on with the aggravated battery? Blah, blah, blah. So I'm saying, uh, we're just going to wait and see how, how Bobby or how Billy Thomas handles it. So... Billy Thomas had on the depositions had said, you know, he, he pulled a knife on my client. And the guy goes, yeah, man, he, he clocked me and he took my, he knocked my teeth out or whatever. Every time I would go to court, they were, be, all three of them were there. And one of them raised his hand in, in, the, in, in court and asked the judge, your honor, can I, uh, can we, can part of the uh, plea agreement, can we make sure that he can't work out with weights in prison? <laughs> And I'm looking over at this guy, and I'm, I'm kind of smirking at him. And so finally, Judge Catherine Pooler, 1992, we go to court, and Bobby's sitting in there. And I had, I knew a, a when we initially got her, uh, uh, indicted on the uh, the the uh, um, when when Janet Reno prosecuted me in '84, and I wound up, uh, I met. Uh, to a Cuban and a Colombian. And the Colombian, um, Richard Carrero, he killed a few guys on a drug shootout. And then Tito had killed a, a kid and his girlfriend over two keys. He was Cuban. But they all got saved at the same time. All of us. So we wound up together in Baker Correctional. And Tito and Richard um, introduced me to a lady named Judy, who's with the Vineyard Ministry. 
So she started giving me some certain scriptures and I, like a psalm that I would memorize. So I remember reading the, sitting there reading. I had a little Christian Life New Testament. I'm just reading it, and, I'm, and I started going to a church called Trinity down the street from the other property mom owned. So I'm sitting there. Billy Thomas walks up to me in this courtroom's crowd. He leans over and he goes, uh, hold on a second. I'm going to pull a sidebar. So he goes up there, and I see him go up with that Cuban uh, prosecutor, uh, Garcia. And they're talking. I hear them. I, I, then I, I hear uh, the, uh, the, 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 it's getting, they're getting a little louder with each other. And finally, my attorney, uh, you can hear him. And then finally, my attorney goes, uh, Your Honor, it got three guys against my client. He admits in a deposition to pulling a knife on my client. There's three of them and one of him. He looks at Garcia and he goes, I got a, he says, number one, the, the, there's three of them. Number two, he admits to pulling a knife in the deposition. Number three, I got a classic self-defense case here. I'm going to trial. And I get the butterflies. Oh, you know, because trials we want to try to avoid. Right. Because if I get convicted, the seven-year plea offer is out the window, as you well know. Yeah. I'm thinking, oh, man, how much time to aggravate a battery in the state of Florida carries a life top. It can carry 15 to life or more. I think it's a life top where it carries 15 to some ungodly uh, top, like 40 or 50 years. So I turn around and I'm sitting there and then immediately, the, uh, excuse my French, but Garcia bitched up quick. He looks at the Judge Pooler. She's she's looking at him like this, and she's kind of smirking at him going, well, counselor? And he looks over at Billy, and he goes, and, and, and he looks at Billy and, and like rapid staccato, almost like, at first it was like Spanish, I thought. And then he goes, will your client do 365 days in the county jail work release? And Billy walks back to me, and he says, I go, what did he say? He goes, will you do 364 days on county jail work release. Right. That way you don't get any good time, right? Well, no. That way you don't go to the state penitentiary. You do work release in North Miami at a little work release thing they've got there. For a whole year? Do you get good time? You don't get, you don't get good time. You've got a year. Okay. Okay. So that's what I pled to. I pled to, I pled to the two counts of aggravated battery. I walked up there. Judge Pooler goes, you report back here for sentencing in 90 days, whatever the date was, she says, Mr. Hudson, if you don't show up, I'm going to reinstate the plea, the seven years plus more for contempt if you don't show up here for the set. She goes, Are you, you, you're pleading to, to the two counts of aggravated battery. The sentence was is known in the state of Florida as a mitigated sentence. The sentence was mitigated from the seven year original offer by the state of Florida to 364 days in county jail, Dade County Jail work release. So I got a job. I had to get a job, be on work release. Right. So that's when mom called, you know, I was, I went back, I'm living with mom again. I'm, we're, we're at home. And she says, I got a call from Tony Spurdy. Tony Spurdy was a famous Gambino soldier. He killed Tommy Altamura and the place for stake 25, almost 30 years before. He's a soldier in the Gambino family. He comes to, he's working for Bob Shepard at Robert's Roofing in Opelika. He met Bob at the Pompano Beach halfway house when they got out of the state prison. Tony Spurdy did 25 years. He's the mechanic at all the machines, the blowers and all this stuff, the motors that run the, the hot tar, uh, 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 the kettles and everything, and the, and the machine, you know, the, the outboard motors that pump the, the hot to the roof. He calls mom and tells her, uh, yeah, tell Mike to come down here yeah, on my on from Monday, and uh, Bob Shepard will give him a job. So I go down there, and that's and I got hired by Robert Roofing. So that's what I uh, and so six months later, almost eight months later, Hurricane Andrew hit. So everybody in that halfway house that I was at, pretty nice place. You know, you got a you're on a lake. You got a color TV. Air conditioned Hurricane Andrew hit while I was in there. We went outside on State Road 9, was it is right there. We cleaned up all those trees that fell down across State Road 9, chopped them up with saws, and and then one day they called us in there and they said, Hey, you guys are getting your sentences are commuted for helping out after Andrew. Andrew was such a bad debacle in the right. in, in, in Miami. You're getting your sentences commuted. 
whatever you got, that's it. So I did six months. Okay. And I walked and I walked. And then you started uh, roofing. I roofing kept company. working for Roberts. And Matthew, I worked for another seven years for at least 25 or maybe 30 roofing companies all over Broward and Day County before at mom died in 94 and I had to finalize the estate from the uh, the essentially from the um, the the scrub that she allowed to become the the uh, executor of the estate fought her for 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 at least three years finally got the house and everything me and Doug divided up the property and then I I mortgaged out the house and uh, became a subcontractor for a big contractor down in South Miami in Kendall named Terry Allen, his super. And then I went and uh, applied in the state of Florida for, uh, you know, to to, uh, to take the exam. But I had to go to a construction college. So that's what I did. I went to a construction college and in Naples and took the exam about four or five months later and, and passed the test, and which is extremely, extremely difficult. The, the you know state certified contractor was all calculations and formulas and negative right. pressures and, and aerodynamic multipliers and uh, so anyway. Um, How long I, did you do that? Uh, from ninety nine, late ninety eight, ninety nine, I got the license until oh six when the feds picked me up in at my uh, at the that, that two million dollar five acre estate at least with an option in Southwest Ranches. But so Bobby, when yeah, but, but I got into debt so bad. Right. That's why I got back in the boat with Bobby because they were right. the the creditors kept, were coming after me for a half a million. So Bobby was released from Florida State Prison for yeah. the Aranoth murder, and the first person he comes to look up is you. Well, from the feds. From the feds. Sorry, he was in Coleman where we were. Oh, really? oh yeah. Yeah, he was. He was when they let Doug go from Louisiana. The the, the Doug did got twenty year sentence in Louisiana. He did ten of that when they when for the they, bank robberies yes. and the shootout. Yeah. No. He got. He did the. Te- he, he did the Louisiana prison time for the shootout. See, then they indicted the feds. Took him up to Baker County where I was at, and they indicted him for the bank robberies. Okay. So Doug pled to the bank robberies, and they ran him consecutive. He did ten years for the. Doug did ten years uh, uh, in in Hunt's Correctional in Louisiana. Then the feds came and picked him up. So he could do his fed time for the bank robberies and they sent Doug to Coleman and Bobby was in Coleman. And that's where they put together the, you know, the, um, Aaron was murder. Well, Aaron was our, no, no, Aaron. Oh, that was years before I, I, I'm sorry. They put together the, uh, Bobby getting out smuggling operate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Get Mike, but we, yeah, Mike, get Mike. We gotta, you gotta have, uh, you know, so Bobby gets out. He comes to you. Gets out of federal prison. Eight, he comes in 89. to you. 89. And says, listen, I'm going to buy a boat. I'm going to, I want to start bringing in Coke from. The Colombians are going to buy the boat. Okay. We're going to have to go down there and, and check out the boat and find the right one. And he took the younger blo- brother of the jumper with him. Okay. And they checked out the, checked out the, uh, uh, a 60 foot sailboat. Um, and, and a few boats, but they, they they picked that one, the trimaran, and that's and they went and you know, went down there, and the Columbians uh, paid for everything, and uh, you know um, the first uh, load, they the Columbians would take a percentage of what we of what we owed on the boat from the back end of the when they paid us for the you know, so that's it, and uh, so you'd bring in the load, and then whatever. You know, whatever the whatever they paid us, they would take a percentage out of that. So ended up Bobby, you know, had married that stripper from from uh, Pure Platinum. Right. But that's the that's how the the you know the the ex hooker girlfriend found out about that. That had probably thrown him quite a bit of money while he was locked up, and then he dumped her and married the stripper, and so she got jealous. And according to my attorney, uh, in the fe- in the federal indictment, she had found out where he lived and gave him up. <laughs> let him know. Let the, let the feds know where he was living. Well, this is when he jumped the parole in, in, in Albuquerque. Right. Yeah. Because when Bobby got released, he had hepatitis so bad they thought he was going to die of it. So they left him alone. He went. He got paroled to Albuquerque, and uh, 
you know, that's when he uh, when he realized he thought he had hoodwinked the 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 uh, the uh, parole system. He flew straight to Fort Lauderdale and came to my front door and said he needed to borrow fifty thousand. I said I don't have it. It's all wrapped up in the house and the property. You know, the, I had I had another house, another property that my mom owned had a pool. You know, and he came, he pulled up, and I'm out there. By this time, I got a, I got a state roofing certification. He's looking at all the all the Jag was in the driveway. He's looking at the uh, you know the, the the brand new Dodge four wheel drives and you know and all this kind of stuff and you know with the roofing company on logo on the side of the truck and what's going on here? I said I got a state license. And he, he needed fifty G's. He says I'm flying to Cali in in a couple of days. Me and Sarah. I go who's Sarah? He goes oh, that's the girl I met. I don't know he the the stripper. Yeah. And. Uh, Anyway, so that was it. They flew down to Cali and and uh, put it together, and then uh, and you st- you guys start. They got financed uh, by the Colombians, and you guys start. You start bringing in the boats, right? Uh, captaining the um uh, the loads that are coming coming in and out. How long does that go on? We're going down to the Caribbean. It, right. it, it went, you know, like uh, probably a better part of a year, year and a half, and then. Uh, that's it. The uh, you know uh, Bobby uh, and during the interim, Bobby, uh, you know when the, when we when you make that kind of money, uh, Bob, I threw some of my roofing. I moved out of there, moving to you know so so I had five properties. So I, I sold uh, you know. Then we went into a uh, in oh one they grabbed Bobby. Bobby got wind that the that the. The the uh, apparently the ex hooker girlfriend, or whatever she was, uh, this this uh, Kathleen Kunzig, uh, she had in, she had informed she had found out she had informed the uh, Albuquerque Federal um, Probation Office, United States Federal Court there that Bobby was not, you know, uh, as as sick as he made out, and that he was in now in Fort Lauderdale. Somehow they got wind. That the, according to my attorney, that Bobby was now in Miami, and then, of course, Bobby had had rented a, a million dollar home up in uh, Fort Lauderdale, well, on on a on a canal where we could bring the boats in and dock them right there. So, so we, we you know that house was rented, and uh, she found out that lo she was trying to little did he know. That the the feds were now get, uh, the his probation officer wanted him to come in, and he didn't. And they put a warrant out for his arrest. And while I'm I, and I uh, I took up with a Cuban girl, the beautiful girl that uh, was a hairdresser, and we were in Tampa. In fact, we came to a Tampa on a big hairdresser uh, thing for three days in the, the convention center up here or something like that. And it was a they would shuttle you back and forth to the airport, and I called Bobby. And said, hey, what's going on? Everything okay? And not really. Uh, what do you mean? He was doing so much coke, right? And bringing in four or five strippers every other night, and dropping twenty thousand a week on 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 the hookers. That uh, yeah, and um, he's uh, he's he's getting a little paranoid, and a couple of times. He's he's uh, he's getting so high in the coke, he's running around the house with a couple of nine millimeters. Well, this happened on two or three different occasions, and uh, one of the occasions I'm at a club from the by the old Fort Apache Marina one night, and I get a call from the stripper wife. She says, "You got to come up here. There's two or three girls in the downstairs uh, bedroom that are locked themselves in." He scared him to death. He's running around the house naked with two nine millimeters. You got to come up here. So I came up there and went upstairs to the loft bedroom and disarmed him. Got it. He says, "Is that you?" I go, "It's me, bro. Give me the gun, 380." And then uh, they had a balcony. So yeah, apparently he's he's having a paranoid delusion that it's like uh, like Scarface. They're throwing a grappling hook up on the balcony rail and they're coming up. So I crank a couple of rounds through the curtain alongside the the sliding door and he goes did you get him i says i got him i says i, I so just stay here we're gonna be and sarah will get rid of the bodies so to make a long story short I'm about 35 40 minutes he's in there so high on coke and i come back it's it close and clear he goes what'd you do with the bodies i put them in my truck i says come on out and i went to sarah and i says get every class a narc you've got in here every everything you've got every xanax 
uh, you know, roofie, whatever you've got. And we, I, I pumped him with 10 of them and put him down. Well, he, she, and, and, and bottom line is she called me the next day. He goes, can you believe he got up the next morning? I said, he should have been, he should have been asleep for two days, at least passed out for two days. So this goes on and on. So when I'm up there with, uh, with Anna at the hair thing at the, in the convention center, I call him from the shuttle and he goes, no, I got everything. Okay. No, not really. Uh, uh, I thought somebody was outside last night. So I ran outside and, uh, you know, some things happened and, uh, come to find out the things that happened. He ran out there butt naked with two nines and cranked them off in that neighborhood. As you got further down the street, the homes were going for three or four million a piece on that canal. That house he was, that we were leasing was only a million, two million dollar home. He banged, he goes to a dentist's door, ba- bangs on the door, butt naked. The dentist uh, he says, who's out there? He says, uh, it's, it's, uh, help me, help me. I live down the street, opens the door and, and, uh, He's already cranked off both clips and the dentist calls the cops. The cops come and the stripper wife goes out and says, we own a charter business down in the Caribbean and we go down there and we're gone for 35 or 40 or two months. Tell me ever many days we're down there and we think somebody's been trying to break in and the cops go, okay. They took the pistols and um, let Bobby go. And that weekend... That weekend, him and Sarah moved out of the whole house. He moved into the embassy suites, and Sarah went back to her mom's. The cops printed the pistols and uh, got the prints and found out who he was. Robert Samuel Young jumped parole in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So now he's got a warrant. So, and we continued to to bring, you know, we continued to right do what we're the doing. Warrant. Yeah, yeah, and that's it. And so they, and so, they so he moved. So we went. We went to Guatemala with a, uh, uh, almost two million on the boat to put into a ba- into, into the Banco de Guatemala, and he had a tax attorney set it up and paid him forty thousand dollars. And it was all it was all bullshit. They took the. We went down there, took the boat down there, hired an, hired another captain out of the out of the uh, Caribbean, out of the Virgin Islands to take the boat down there. Went down there, and wait. wait can I stop for a second? When he says he he paid. So Bobby paid, he paid somebody, an accountant, to tax attorney, a tax attorney. He paid him forty grand to set it up so that he could take cash into a bank in Guatemala and deposit it. Like, hey, you know, we're gonna bring that, but don't worry, I got a guy. Give me forty grand. I've set it all up for you. You can go down there with the cash. But it's bullshit. He just took the forty grand. He never called. He didn't know anybody in the bank. So then Bobby tries to go in with the fucking money. Sorry, or we flew down there, and, and, and uh, the, the captain, the the, the uh, we hired a charter boat captain out of, out of the Virgin Islands. Flew him in. He took the boat down to Guatemala. Bobby and I flew down on American Airlines. What year was this? Uh, two thousand uh, two thousand one. Yeah, nine eleven. Yeah. So about two weeks before 9-11, three weeks, something like two weeks before, we got down there and the boat was at a marina on the, on the Pacific side of Guatemala. So we had to take, we had to, we were at the, we were at the Intercontinental Hotel in suites. Each of us had a private, Bobby and Sarah, and then I had a suite, my own suite, went upstairs and uh, went to the roof and, you know, the helicopter came in, picked us up and flew us over to the boat. We took about 400,000 in cash off the boat and brought it back. So I put maybe two hundred fifty thousand in my safe, in my suite. Excuse me. And then uh, he uh, he says, "Oh, we're going to go to Banco de Guatemala tomorrow to, with the tax attorney set it up. We're going to go down there, and we're going to uh, deposit the money." And so we sat down there in a little little cafeteria, having uh, a cafe con leche. And I had a I'll never forget. I had a, a rancho huevos rancheros. Right, and Bobby's sitting there eating and picking at something that he that he ordered. I'm eating breakfast because I'm hitting the gym pretty hard. And she goes up there with uh, the four hundred thousand, and then walks in there. And the vice president of the Banco de Guatemala tells Sarah, "Senora, you cannot bring this kind of money into this country. You have to wait here. I have to go get the presidente and the security." Ah! So we had our own cell phones in uh, 
in, in Guatemala City. We had our own cell phones right. when we got down there. Plus, we had a sat phone. So she called him, and he's screaming her at the top of his lungs, get your ass out of there and get down here right now, called a cab. She barely made it out. She came down. It looked like a, like almost like a courthouse. That's what their banks looked like, like a courthouse. Right. Uh, crenellated steps going up to the uh, 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 portico with columns. And Banco de Guatemala, she came down there. We jumped in the cab, and we went to another hotel immediately. And uh, that was it. Flew the money back and put it on the boat and sent the boat back across the Caribbean all the way to uh, the island of St. Vincent. And uh, <laughs> uh, we were bumped by a, Then 9-11 hit. Because I remember being up, we were going, we're out going out and partying at night and, and, you know, drinking a little bit, but eating, eating real good. Don't drink the water. We both got real sick there twice. Yeah. Dysentery. And they had a, they, the concierge at the hotel, you'd call them. They said, we will send the doctor up now. They'd send up the doctor and she'd give me a shot. Well, whatever it was she gave me, I was good in four hours, five hours. So, uh, American Airlines bumped us. Then, not, then I'm laying there one morning, got it on mute. And I'm watching the, the, the two towers. I watched the one tower's burning. I watched the, the, the plane fly into the second one. And I'm looking at this. And I'm thinking, what, you know, and I, and I turn up the volume and, you know, New York City, this is the second plane, uh, second tower. It's just a plane is flown in the second. So I, I ran down the hallway and banged on his door and woke him up and says, you better turn on CNN. So we got bumped by American Airlines for what six? It was six weeks. We were down there, yeah, Jeez. because of the the curfew. So we had to. So he Bobby goes, "You got to get us. We got to get out of here." So we turned around and, uh, um, uh, I contacted Hoppage Jet in Fort Lauderdale when they lifted the curtain, and I said, "You got three Americans down here in Guatemala City. Can you come get us?" He goes, "We got one small Lear left. The rest of them are out." He goes, uh. You got the same problem some other people that we, uh, that, you know, that we're going to pick up have. He goes, where are you? Guatemala City. He goes, I'll be there at 745 tomorrow. How much? 10,000. So I came down there and, and gave him 10 grand. They picked us up the next morning, 745, and flew us into Fort Lauderdale. So. And, and, uh, that was October. They, uh, let's see, 9-11, or, uh, not 9-11, but, uh, yeah, 9-11, right? September 11th. Right. We got in there in the early, uh, the second week of October, and they had Bobby on the, on the end of October. Right after Halloween, they grabbed Bobby, or before Halloween, they grabbed him. He came in the house that uh, that I leased up there in uh, in Fort Lauderdale. Up right. there in uh, uh, Lighthouse Point. Pom- uh, Pom- Lighthouse uh, Pompano. I leased the, leased the property for, for Bobby. How did you find out uh, that he got caught, that no, he got arrested? I would, I was going out with a girl named Michelle by then who I'd met at, at uh, a roofing company, the second roofing company I'd worked for. And what a beauty she was. But anyway, uh, Michelle, a little crazy. But, um, and I called, uh, she, uh, you know, I was roofing pretty hard. And I was getting some, some pains in my, in my, you know, running down the back of my tricep and, you know, thumbs and forefinger, uh, forefingers and uh, index, and, and the thumbs were getting a little numb. So it was like a pinched nerve in my neck. So she sent me to a to a, a neurologist, and I went to this uh, on Sterling Road in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, while I'm sitting there in his office, he leads, and uh, I get a call, and it's the stripper, the wife. She says the FBI, the DEA, the US, United States Marshals, um, ATF. They came in every window of the house. This is a $4 million home right there on the edge of the, of the canal, right there on the water with about 350 feet of dock space. Okay. And they, uh, we had a- Grabbed they, them, right? Grabbed him, grabbed Sarah. And you know, the, the rest is history. He started giving it up immediately. He started, yeah, he started snitching from jump, right, right there, from Jump Street. And uh, I figured when I walked out to the parking lot, I said, why are you calling me in my cell? That's the first thing I asked her. So I called Michelle and said, uh, go to the, uh, uh, call the Hyatt Regency. Here's my credit card number. Call the Hyatt Regency and Davey. We're going to the, no, the Hilton. I said, we're going to get a room at the Hilton for three or four days. Why, Michael? I said, just do it. 
So she took the credit card number, reserved me a room. I went back to the house, got the German Shepherds, took them to Knowles Animal Clinic, grabbed uh, all the cash out of the safe, to grab the gun safe, took all the weapons and all my uh, the heavy weapons especially, and took them to a buddy's house. And we put him in his attic, and I took everything else to the safety deposit box at the bank in, in North Miami. And then grabbed Michelle, or she met me up there, and then we stayed up at the Hilton for uh, five days. And waited, I waited, and I called my neighbor. When I go out on the boat, my neighbor was a Cuban uh, named George, and he would come over and feed the cat. He had a key to the house, and uh, always had a key. I said, uh, go over there and get the mail. He goes, oh, Mike, you out of, he would think I was roofing out of, out of state or something. And uh, George would, you know, I would call him up and say, anything going on? See, see, he goes, no, why? I go, well, look. I said, if you see any cars or anything, call me in my cell. If you see any cars, pull up in the driveway. Because I, I moved both trucks. I moved everything. The Jag, everything moved. I moved it that afternoon. And uh, I took them to the church and parked them at the church park. <laughs> so then I turned around. I was big, big, you know, right there on the uh, big church, Trinity. So I turned around and... Uh, and uh, and then I moved them later, but you know, um, I uh, went to the Hilton and stayed with Michelle and waited. And uh, where they grab you? They uh, they they didn't. I waited three, four, or five days, and then the ne- other next door neighbor on the right side, she was the mother of the kid that was with Bobby when they were in prison in Cuba. Okay. And the oldest son was the one that got lost in Hurricane David. Okay. So I, they had another son who was a crackhead. He had been a big smuggler too, but he lost everything and he got on crack. So, he, you know, I called I called over there and asked him, hey, see anything weird going on? And he goes, what do you mean, man? What, what Mike? He, he snapped to it immediately. I said, see any, uh, anything looks like any unmarked cars or anything like that? He says, nah, nothing. So we waited three or four days. I finally went back home. When I went back to the house, and I had my the foreman of my two crews, they were running the roofs and everything. I went back to the house and had the call identifier back then and hit it. And the first message I got, it said right there, it couldn't even, there was, it was so long, it couldn't even fill up the, uh, the identifier. It said Federal Bureau of. And I went, holy mackerel. What? And then I tried to call the number back. This com- this number cannot be called back. You cannot call this number. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was it. And I realized he had called me from the Federal Bureau of the, from the FBI office. Right. He called me from right. there. So that was it. I, 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 uh, Dougie had gotten in touch with me, and I let him know Bobby got busted. You know, so. That was it. Doug Doug said, don't answer any of his mail. I said, I don't intend to. He says, if he writes you a letter, something's not right. And he started writing me a bunch of letters. Wanted me to go down to the Caribbean. He wanted me to go grab, go over here. And grab the, you know, he had close to 20 million, 15 million maybe. I don't know, it was scattered around, but I don't know. And wanted me to go down to the Caribbean to a, to a certain island and grab one of the boats, move that boat, do this, do that. And he's writing me all these letters, and I know that they're reading his mail, and I know that, that the phones are tapped. Right. So from there, I, I froze on him. You know, and uh, Hurricane Wilma hit a few years later, and I and I and I did millions. I did millions when Wilma hit, and then uh, Bobby Bobby was locked up, in the, and he found out about it. He started sniffing around because Sarah's the stripper's parents called me. So one day they called me on several different occasions and I'm thinking something's not right. They're fishing for him. He's wanting to know once he found out that, you know, what he did was he, I, I, essentially he turned around and just gave everybody up on the house just out of spite because he was locked up and nobody else was. That's what, that's the word that I got. Right. You know, from the attorney. Well, when did you get arrested? Well, I got arrested before the statute of limitations ran out. What was that, five years? Five years. November 7th, Election Day, 2006. South, by this time, I was, in, I was in Southwest Ranches, you know. What was the, what was the, what was the amount of the indictment? Was the, the dollar amount was like, it was outrageous. It was, 
Well, yeah, I mean, they, you know what they do. They, yeah, they, they add them all up. Uh, and, they, 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 uh, they cut it 50 times yeah. the feds and then they, they multiply it times the amount of grams yeah. in a kilo. Ghost, and, and ghost they, dope, right? Ghost yeah. dope. Yeah. So it's uh, some ungodly amount. It's like 45 million or something or oh, more. That was just the amount, of, that was the amount of money that they never recovered in U.S. funds that they thought indictments 45 says like 45 million dollars yeah. or something is out it's a fucking ridiculous yeah but they they were talking uh you know when I'm reading when I'm when the the the, the younger clacker I'm getting the discovery from the attorney when I'm reading that it's I'm looking at it it's got to be a, a typo 22,000 kilos so I'm reading it I'm reading the indictment and uh I ended up pleading to uh the last boatload so you know it was a total of the uh, uh, twenty two hundred and seventy keys, but uh, that but the what no uh, immaterial of uh, you know how many uh, loads were brought in. The feds are usually they're they're all an individual uh, uh, account. They will have you plead guilty to one count. Right. For- that that was part of their deal. So it was forty five point five million dollars of cocaine imported of a controlled substance into the United States. Damn. Um, um, so, you know, uh, yeah, which they didn't have a gram of. Right. They never had a gram. They, listen, they didn't have anything but an informant. Right. That's all they had. Uh, based on uncorroborated hearsay testimony with no evidence. This is what, this is our, this is our, our uh, American taxpayer dollars hard at work. Well, so they they grab you. You don't go to. You can't go to trial. No, of course not. Uh, you've got. You're gonna have. Bobby's gonna testify. And then they. And, then my attorney was was uh, initially with the first one. I cut him a check for five figures. Eddie O'Donnell. He was the attorney that got famous under the 1980 Miami riot, the McDuffie case. He represented the cop that killed McDuffie. They killed the black guy on the motorcycle. They tried to run the police officer over. The police officer hip shot, one in a million shot, uh, a, a head shot. And then that's when they rioted. When he got, when he, when Eddie represented him, uh, Eddie O'Donnell represented him and got him off. And that's when they rioted in 1980 in Miami. That was, he was, the, he was that was, that, that's what cat, catapulted him into the limelight, Eddie O'Donnell. So he represented me initially before I, uh, Wound up with another attorney for the plea, so you took a plea for what? I pled to uh, one count of the the one count. I mean, how much time? Oh, I, uh, seventeen years. But they armed careered me. Right. See, they armed careered me on the guns, and they careered me under the Career Offender Act on the uh, on the uh, on the uh, drugs with with uh, that they didn't have a gram of. See, so they ran it. The judge ran it concurrent. He hated my case. He looked at that uh, at that bum Powell. The 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 prosecutor. He says, "You know, this this defendant shouldn't even be in front of me. I know all about your star witness." See, they used Bobby to set up a high season interdictment, and he tipped them off. He got immunity. He got immunity on seven or eight homicides going back to the late seventies or early eighties. They gave him immunity on everything. See, there you see. Now think about that. Benny Kramer, all all bullshit, right? Right. And now Bobby is, is, thinks he's going to hoodwink the government again, so he's going to set up a, a a boat to come in, for, you know, with what I don't know, however many thousands of kilos on the boat. He's going to set that boat up, and then they're going to let him walk. Now he's got the Hep C. He's not really showing any real signs or symptoms of a, of like a relapse, but that's what killed him. See, the hep C. And because uh, um, uh, he never got out. Right. So he turns around and has the stripper wife tip him off, according to my attorney. But the last attorney that I, that I, uh, that, you know, that I retained, uh, the Charles Craig Stella. So this is St- Stella. This bum turns around and tells me he knew all about the stripper wife tipping off the feds. And then he, or the, the hooker wife, tipping off the, the feds, excuse me. And then that Bobby had 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 tipped off the Colombians that, that the federales were waiting on them. So they never grabbed them. So their big newspaper, 
their front their faces on the front of the of the newspaper. Never happened. Yeah, never happened. So J. Robert Acosta, the United States Attorney for the Eleventh Circuit, that got depo de, that they got that had to step down because of the case with the child molester that had the island. Oh yeah, yeah. Um Epstein. Epstein. He was the attorney that allowed him to walk from Jump Street years before. And when and uh, I forget what what who appointed him. Did Obama appoint him? I don't know. Anyway, Epst, uh, 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 J. Robert Acosta was the United States attorney for the 11th Circuit. And he was the attorney at the time when uh, the, this indictment came down. And he went to Roger Powell and he goes, hey, uh, what happened to the big indictment? I mean, the big high seas interdiction. We don't know. They went back in the phone taps, found out Sarah, like, instead of just going to a pay phone with $50 and quarters, she turns around and goes and calls him from the landline, which is tapped, and says, Poppy, Daddy says, uh, turn around. It's a setup, federales. So they found out that she had, and so they jerked his immunity. So what did he get? He got a 5K1 and a Rule 35 that Freddie Haddad worked out for him when he, when he started crying about because I got all the discovery. From the from from my attorney, and all the letters that he wrote the judge, I I did a good thing, and all the about being a rat. I did a good thing, and uh, and now I'm suffering for it. And uh, the the government jerked my immunity, Your Honor, and and wah wah wah, and oh boo hoo, you know. And uh, so Freddie Haddad got him a fight, worked out a deal with the government. Well, will will you give him a five K one or Rule thirty five if he gives up his wife and all of his friends? And there you go. Nobody was in, yeah, but he started, I got the discovery, he started snitching from Jump Street that very day. How much time did you do, total? 14? On 17 years, I did 14 and a half. 14 and a half, went to the halfway house, Six got out. Six years in Georgia in the pen, and, uh, you know, me got, and, got moved me from Fabio, below. Guillermo Rocha, and then, uh, um, who knew Bobby. All right, you and got then, moved from the low for? Went from the media, went, went from, the, from the Georgia pen to Coleman. Yeah, from the pen to Coleman, then you were at the low with me, then I wrote the story, then you got charged with inciting a riot. With me and the Puerto Ricans. <laughs> and this, uh, yeah, this, this, this counselor, um, the day that that senator got shot, Scalia, mm-hmm. and, uh, and I remember going, I worked at, uh, remember I had the job, um, a facility. A facility. Yeah. Facilities. Facilities. And uh, we got fog, so we got sent back. Fog count. I fell asleep. And uh, fog count. Oh my God. I about that. Um, then all of a sudden, I hear everybody talking about a shooting or something. Like that. Trump got shot. They shot Trump. They shot Trump. And I wake up, you know, to go to go to the re- to go to the bathroom. And I look up, and they, sh- they go, "Yeah, Trump got shot." It was the senator at yeah. that ball game. So I come back. I fall asleep. And then all of a sudden, now they're making everybody go. All the Latinos go to the computers, and then all of us American and and the blacks and the, and the whites, we go into the TV room. And as I'm the one, and and this uh, counselor uh, walks in with a big wart in her chin, and uh, walks up and wakes me up. I don't even know her. She's on the other side of uh, a sea dorm upstairs, and she wakes me up and says, "You got to go into the TV room." So I'm walking down the. You know, I grab my chair and I'm walking down there. There's a young uh, kid that was about three or four uh, cubes down. He goes, "Mike, they're uh, these feds. They're they're what's going on?" They are, he says, "They're they're they're killing all the feds." So People yeah, I make heads. a comment back to him. She turns around and runs to the war. I go in the TV room. She runs to the warden and says, uh, "You know, because when I woke up, I heard a, there was a lot of lockers banging and stuff like this when I was." Still asleep, and I woke up and go, "What's going on?" It sounds like the Puerto Ricans are rioting in here or something. I hear a lot of. You know, she turns around, uh, makes a bunch of lies, like the like the, uh, you know, the um, lily livered little chicken shit fed that she is, right? And goes and tells the captain that that uh, I decided to riot with the Puerto Ricans, like a, a bald faced lie. They threw it all out in, in DHO court, right? And then says, "Oh, uh, when the kid goes, oh, they're killing all the feds," and I go, "Oh," I says, "I don't know." I says, uh, it sounds like the, you know, it's, it's about time they got around to it. I'm thinking that it was, uh, you know, um, 
maybe a terrorist act of some kind. I wasn't really sure what was going on. So she turns around and 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 flips that and and then tells the captain, yeah, he, uh, you know. So they come in the TV room and grab me, and they put me in and put me in there with, uh, you know, I, I, they throw it out in DHO, DHO court. They put me in there with Spinelli, and then you know, so okay, Mike Spinelli, he was a Lucchese soldier, so we uh, we knew each other pretty well, and then you know, eventually the, they 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 uh, throw it out, and I end up. Uh, they said, "No, we're going to ship you anyway." So they said, they, "So I got shipped to Yazoo." So well, I mean, you got out and you went to truck driving school, and now you're driving a truck. I ran a roofing company on the, in the summer of '21, and yeah, and then I, uh, you know, I got to get they, that that contractor who knew me from the old days. Right. He he did a little prison time, so he hired me. You know, the Cherry Brothers, and he hired me, and. Uh, um, I just, uh, he paid for the class B to get reinstated because I had a class B for almost 15 years and then turned around and I decided to get the A. So I got the A and then. Okay. We drive a, we drive a semi across the U S and get caught in snowstorms and. <laughs> All right, listen, I'm going to wrap it up. Let me wrap this up you real quick. You can delete that. Yeah, there's some Sorry. stuff we'll, we'll delete. Some of the- <laughs> All right. All right. Um, well, one, I appreciate you coming by. So this is good. Thank you, brother. All right. Um, all right. Hey, if you like the video, do me a favor. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell so you get notified of videos just like this. Uh, share the video. Leave a comment in the comment section, and I will try and respond. And if you want to get in touch with me to be a guest, you have an interesting story, uh, please send me an email. My email is in the description box. Really appreciate you guys watching. Thank you very much. See ya. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I'm here with Michael Hudson. Michael Martini Hudson, actually. No, don't say Michael Martini. <laughs> Mar- I'll start over. Mar- Mar- Martin. What, what Martin? Could, yeah, the, on the driver's license, it says Martin because they made a mistake, but it's M-A-R-T-E-I-N-E. That's actual. So just say Michael Martini Hudson. Okay.